By my phone, it's 601. So I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of December 13th, 2021. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Yeah, here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Council Member Yering? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. Do you have a quorum? May I, do we have any public speakers on the closed session items? Let me confirm that. Uh, no, you don't have any speakers signed up for this item, and I don't see any raised hands in Zoom. We will now recess to closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 p.m. to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. So I, we should all exit and go over and sign in on the appropriate location.
Okay. Uh, we're still short, Mikey. Just want to give him a, a couple of minutes. Okay. It looks like Mikey's in the meeting, but he has his camera and audio off. I'm sure he'll be right there. Back, sorry. That's all right. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of December the 13th, 2021. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by a roll of call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and public. May I have a roll call? Council Member Fair. Here. Council Member Pearson. Present. Council Member Uring. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Here. Mayor Grisanti. Here. You have a quorum. I'll lead, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance yes. to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America. And, to and to the, the Republic, Republic for which it stands. stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. May I have a closed session report? Yes, Mr. Mayor. At 5.30 p.m., I'm sorry, at 6 o'clock p.m., the council uh, appeared to open session and then recessed to closed session for the item listed on the agenda. All five council members were in attendance and no reportable action was taken. Thank you very much. May I have an approval of the agenda? Uh, I'll make a motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to move item 6A, which has been delayed multiple times to right after the consent calendar. And as the, as the agenda says, to continue item 4C to January 10th. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Kelsey, will you call the roll, please? Council Member Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Uri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And once again, we're, we're moving 6A to right after uh, the consent calendar. Correct. Great. Okay. So that takes us to. Mayor the, Grisanti, uh, are you ready for a report on the posting of the agenda? Yes, I am, and thank you so much. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on December 2nd, 2021. Thank you. Uh, I believe our next item is item 1A, a report on the Woolsey Fire Rebuilding, and, we'll, and Yolanda Bundy will deliver the report. Yes, good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you a uh, brief report regarding the fire reveal. Next slide. The Woolsey fire ignited on November 8th, 2018, and burned close to 100, um, close to 100,000 acres. Woolsey by far is the most destructive fire we have faced. The county-wide destruction included 1,600 stru structures. Next slide. As fires to relate to the city of Malibu, 
488 destro complete destroyed uh, structures. This included two apartment complexes, 18 dwelling units, and we also had partial damage of more than 150 parcel, which included the native motel. The native motel had partial damages to the rooms, the room decks, the, well, the wellness center, and all their utilities and infrastructures were completely destroyed. Next slide. Right after the fire, a post disaster sa safety assessment occurred at the city. In conjunction with the LA County Public Works and Cal OES Office of Emergency Services, more than 600 parcels were surveyed. Next slide. The first phase of the rebuild started with the site cleanup and the household hazardous waste. This is the removal of all the toxic and toxic waste, which included fertilizers, pool chemicals, paints, etc. These were cleaned immediately and contained as quickly as possible to minimize the exposure to emergency personnel, the public, and workers that will be in, that would have been involved on the rebuild effort. Next slide. During phase two, the debris removal of the properties and the cleanup occur. This happened during December of 2018 to December 2019. During this phase two, there were two options to community uh, families. Option one is to have Los Angeles County Public Works and Call Recycle remove the debris and clear the site. The option two was the local fire debris removal program. In conjunction with LA County Public Works, uh, we allow the con local contractors to remove debris. The work included removal of all structural debris, foundations, and to make it uh, clean for the crews. And there were some soil testing and removal to ensure that the sites were clean and safe for the rebuild. Next slide. During the debris clearance, uh, the, uh, the joining efforts with LA County was very important. In December of 2019, a year later of the fire, 488 structure, uh, uh, were sites were completely cleaned out. Next slide. There was also a priority to reinstate power right away. City staff got involved. Next slide. The restore of power was done on over the counter permit and issues to restore power to and electricity to those properties with destroyed structures, either by temp power and just for the cleanup of the sites. Next slide. Other portion of the rebuild that sometimes is missed or not mentioned is those 150 permits that were issued over the counter for partial damage or repair issues. Such uh, damages were window uh, damages, plywood damage, smoke damage, eave damage, partial roof, and exterior wall framing. Next slide. During the first stages of the rebuild, 59 temporary homes were approved, permitted, and inspected, giving the opportunity for the homeowners to live on their sides while construction was occurring. Next slide. The city of Malibu created a three-step process for the rebuild. Step one was about the planning approval and the input from other agencies. Step two, the plan check process and the agency's approval. And finally, the step three, construction during the permit and the, and the inspections. Next slide. Though the process seems simple, one, two, three, the families were not expecting to go through this process. Ne they needed to comply with all local and state requirements in order to have their permits. Step two, as you can see, a significant amount of reviews that needs to happen um, due to the state and local ordinance. Building and safety review the plan. There's also geological and geotechnical 
environmental health, public works, planning department, and fire department. Each side is very complex and, 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 and there's challenges along the way. Next slide. So where are we today? We have issued 326 approvals from the planning department. For construction permits, we only have issued 211. There's 62 homes that have been completed and we currently have 149 in the construction. I wanna spend the next uh, uh, slides, one more, I'm sorry, next slides, please. We also have multi-family projects. Six of them are under construction and 12 of the dwelling units have been completed. It is also important to mention that the city has additionally issued and approved and final six accessory dwelling units. Next slide. I wanna spend time on reviewing the process and percentage of where we are and uh, where we're going. The planning process, 326 approved planning. Uh, plans have received appro planning approval. There's 19 under planning review that the planning staff is currently reviewing. The 326 approval by planning constitutes 67 of the rebuild, of the total rebuild. If you add the 19, that give you 345, which constitutes 71% of the total rebuild. That means we have 29% that have not submitted approval to the planning department. 143 property owners have a still need to submit to the planning approval for the step one. Next slide. Under the building process, we have issued 211 permits and I have 68 plan checks and families under the process. But there's still 47 families that have received planning approval and I have not seen their projects come in into building and safety. So what am I doing about this? So what are the cities doing about it? We're contacting those 68 families that are under the plan check process to try to facilitate a meeting with the design professionals and with me so I can create a roadmap and try to mobilize things and or better answer their questions or challenges that they're having. The next step will be to contact all those 47 uh, families that have planning approval, but still have not submitted to building and safety. When I review the 68 homes and they are under plan check review, some of them have received corrections back in during May, and there's been already almost four to five months, and I have not heard back from them. So that is a reason why I'm spending the time on one-on-one -on -one and, and try to figure out what is the issues and how do we can best facilitate move things forward. If you see the total, uh, if you add the 211 plus a 68, that means we have 279 under the plan check process, which is uh, they're moving towards that construction. That is only 57% of the total rebuild. There's still a lot of work to do ahead of us and um, we're committed to continue helping the public. The next slide, please. So let's talk about construction and inspection process. We do have 149 homes that are under construction and 62 home families that have received their certificate of occupancy and will be celebrating Christmas or the holidays in their homes. But we expect that to have more than 68 more homes going obtain permits in the next two to three months. That means we'll have 217 homes that will be under rebuilt. The homes that we're seeing right now have a more complex foundation systems. This is not a, a conventional foundation. Malibu has a lot of geotechnical and geological challenges, and a lot of the foundation systems have piles, graving, basements, that takes more steps for the process. Next slide. The next slide show you the permitted issuance uh, graphic. 
um, and there is a typo on this uh, on this uh, slide. It's from September 2018 till uh, nowadays. If you can see the graph, the the blue is the non wallsy permits that the city has issued. And this, I'm just talking about building and safety uh, operations. The red is a wool fire permits, and the pink it was a debris removal. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, debris removal occurred on the first three months more significantly, and they ended at the end of December of 2019. Then the re rebuilt uh, wool permits have been moving forward in a constant manner. And, but the regular operations for the city, we are seeing about a 10 to 15% increase from previous years prior to that Wolsey fire. So we are extremely busy. Another thing that I would like for you guys to uh, take a look is that they do, this also include the numbers during the global pandemic. The city operations, as you can see, did not stop. We were able to issue regular permits and we'll see fire permits. Next slide. The operation during the global pandemic, what a tragedy and what an unexpected e event that happened for all of us. But I feel more for the families that, that um, had to go through this after the fire. Under this unprecedented time, the city building and safety remain open with inspection staff, building counter staff, and your building official. We were able to issue, if you look at the month of March of 2020, when the pandemic started, when everybody closed the doors, the city of Malibu did not. We were there in person, issuing, providing inspections, and doing the work that it needed to be done. 196 permits were issued, in the month of March, 74 plan checks were done in most of it in house and I was doing it myself. And 519 inspections were performed during the month of March. There were challenging times. We were trying to figure out things, but things did not stop us. Um, some of the, the, uh, the numbers that I would like to highlight to you is that the numbers continue to be, be increased on the inspections. They were from high 500 to 800 to 840. And this is just, this is just encapsulating the March 2020 to December 2020. The highest number of per rebuild permits that we issue, it happened on the May of 2020. We issue 103 fire rebuilds uh, permits with an overall of 163 for, for the permitting process. Next slide. I also want to give you a glance of the operations for building and safety, and I'm providing you in the statistics of the past five months. As you can see, our numbers for plan check are continue to increase. We see a high of 209 and 184, averaging 195. And this is the overall. Under fire rebuilds, we're averaging 45 and a height of 51. There is a total also number that you see in the screen. The total constitutes the three years since the beginning of the pandemic. I'm sorry, since the see after the Wolsey we'll fire. So November of 2018 to uh, today's day. On plan check review on Wolsey we'll Fire, we have done 1,497, and the overall is 4,509. And on permits, with mostly two counter techs, we uh, got, got an additional counter tech at the beginning of 2021. We have 7,462. Again, it's a increase in comparison with, with, for what you have seen before in normal operations. Next slide. And then inspections. 
25,000 inspections have been done and performed at the city since the, uh, November 2018 to nowadays. The last five uh, months highlight that our inspections have doubled from what the numbers that I showed you on March of 2020. We are seeing an increase of, uh, in November of 2021, you can see the numbers for the overall inspections for the department, 1,012. And this includes grading, uh, your plumbing mechanical and electrical inspections, your framing inspections, your foundation inspections, your solar, your septic tanks. So it's a significant number of inspections. I only have three inspectors and we are operating to full capacity. Uh, next slide. But the most important thing that I want everybody to remember that we still remain committed to the families. And that's why I'm here. And that's why staff is continue to push hard. It's, it's not about the numbers of how, it's about the families and their lives and how can we best impact their lives and give them back and get them back home. It's been three years, it's frustrated and a lot of them are upset and a lot of them have gone through so much, through so, so much. Next slide. We look forward to continue serving the community. Um, with the support of council and the trust of council and the support of the community, we will continue the rebuild efforts together. This, this is a, this is this gonna take the effort of everybody. And wanna remind you, we're still in the middle of helping many families rebuild. Like I mentioned before, we only have review and we're going through the process of 57% under the plan check process, but the, the construction and all the challenges that the family is still facing nowadays are significant. The cost of the materials, the lack sometimes of concrete during the COVID and so many challenges that they have gone through. Um, my heart goes to them, and I think that is the reason why I'm, I'm continue pushing for as much as I can. Um, we continue offering the resources and the assistance to the homeowners, and I, my, my message to all of them this night is, please let me help you out. Let me help you through every step and let staff help you through the step that, steps that you need, either in the plan check process, the construction process. We are here to serve the public. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. I see Mikey has raised his hand. Um, first of all, down. Yolanda, thank you so much for that report. It is really sobering, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to give us such a thorough look at where we're at. You and I talked the other day, and I told you I was going to ask you this question, so I think you know what I'm going to ask you. What do you need that you don't have? What can the city council do to help with this process? Um, I know how hard this is. I know you need more resources. You don't have to answer completely now or you can, but whatever it is, uh, you know, I believe I speak for we, I certainly speak for me, want to find those resources, allocate those resources, um, whatever you need, especially as it looks like it's just getting thicker and thicker right now. Yes, and, and for me, um, how can I continue providing the services that the community deserve and that community needs? So as I'm looking on inspections, you saw that 25,000 25, inspections that we have done and just looking ahead for the future and trying to, to uh, project what we're gonna need inspections. I only have three inspectors. I have contract services for two, but it's sometimes I don't get the quality of, of personnel that, it, that the city needs. And so it's hard to on contracts to rely on contract services. So I'm thinking inspections is gonna be a, 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 a task that we need to really look into it, possibly add in a one more inspector. And then my counter texts, I, I mean, you know, Marianne, you know, Julie, you know, Dee, um, very dedicated, they live in the city, 
they work extra hours they're they're fully committed and their heart and their their mind is all in there but they need help even if they're working and staying late it's not a sustainable pace we still in the middle of it and as you're looking through all of this I gave you numbers, but there's still revisions that are happening at the site that we need to, that we need a meeting with uh, contractors and homeowners and try to move those things along. And, and, and every other challenge, I'm getting complaints. So just try to, we're running thin and the heart is there and the passion is there and, and that wanted to help is there, but we need help. So counter tech and uh, inspector. Okay, I'll I'll follow up with you and and uh, Steve McClary, and we'll bring an item forward here as soon as we can um, immediately. So uh, I hear you loud and clear. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Mikey. I see Bruce and then Karen. Karen actually had her hand up way before me, so it might have gone down by accident. If you want to go first, Karen. Otherwise, Karen? I'll be happy to talk. Please. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. I'll make it brief, Yolanda. I just want to acknowledge your dedication your level of expertise, um, your compassion, and your leadership. Uh, you and your team, I know you are working long hours. You're, you're not a nine-to-fiver. I doubt you ever have been in your life. My assumption is you start early, you work late, and I know you also work weekends. I want to thank you for that. Uh, I believe uh, the city and your department has taken a lot of criticism. I hope that this report helps explain to people what is happening. Uh, I agree with Mikey. I'd like to see you get more help. And I just, I, I, I agree with everything you said, not just the, the quantifiable things, but it has been a struggle for all of our families to rebuild. And each of us knows that that could have been us. We were, you know, a few houses away or a block away or something from getting burned out ourselves. And so we feel it. I, I just want to thank you. And I want to say I'm committed and I'm sure the rest of the council is committed to getting to the finish line and, and getting as many people as possible back in their homes. All right. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Bruce. All right. Thanks, Paul. So, um, Yolanda, first of all, I mean, thank you for the heartfelt and empathetic presentation. I mean, I, I, I know how much you care. And um, I've heard nothing but excellent things about the work you've done and the help you've provided. Um, and I clear, we clearly understand you need more help because you can't do it by yourself. And I know you have staff, but you need, you need more staff. I, I've, I've spoken to Steve already previously, um, and I'm sure everyone has about – getting more inspectors at a bare minimum and whatever else you need. I mean, I would favor, I know we have got some budget issues in the city, although I'm told they're turning around and getting better, but I would favor finding ways to cut other um, budget and, and get more money to get more people to get this done and, until the Woolsey fire rebuilds are over in any event. Um, I also um, wonder whether we couldn't create a structure and this is not just in your department or in, in the building and, and planning, but also at the planning commission of bumping rebuilds at a bare minimum rebuilds of primary residences of people who actually lost their home and are rebuilding their home, not somebody who bought the property to the front of the line whenever they are ready for any kind of an approval. Because, you know, they're in a different footing than anyone else in the city. And I'm not saying that everyone doesn't have the right to be heard and go forward, but our, our friends and neighbors who have lost their homes and who want to get back to their home um, have to come for, have to have come absolutely first. In, in that regard, I, I have one question for you. I don't know if you know if you have the statistics or know the answers, but of the 326 um, rebuilds that have planning approval, do you know how many of them are principal residences of people who lost their home? I do not have those numbers. Uh, I, I, I'm hearing more and more that some of the property owners are selling their uh, parcels. And so, but I don't have those numbers for you. Bruce, you seem to be frozen. Uh, we'll come back to you and go to Steve now, I think. 
Yes, uh, Yolanda, I just want to echo everybody else's comments. I mean, you, you and I talk occasionally, and, you know, the, the, the bright spot of talking to some of the residents is when they mention the help that you've given my, them. Just sorry, my connection oh, sorry. died. I I'm, I'm sorry, let, let Bruce finish up, Paul. Please, Bruce, I'm sorry. Bruce, I'm also, I, that's okay, my connection what died. I, and I, what, I was sorry, a, what I was stating that I don't have those numbers um, right now, I can certainly get in and share it with you. And as far as moving people I don't know, on top of the line, that's what um that's what it's all about, and that's what I'm calling directly those families of 60, 68 that are on the plan check process. So I can expedite it. I can understand what are the challenges and keep on moving them forward. Um, I I mean I I have so many stories and like the more I I get involved on this and my I'm personally so attached to them. And so my intent is to get him as back home as soon as possible. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And anything we can do to help you get there and help our residents get back to their homes, please, please let us know. And, and again, I just want to say that, I'm, again, everyone has a right to fair process, but I hope that we are actually distinguishing between people who are getting back to their home and other people who just happen to be building a home that was burned in the fire because they stand in different footing. Thank you, Thank Bruce. You. Steve? Yeah, I'll go back. I, like I said, I agree with everything everybody said, Yolanda. If we can get you some help, uh, I will certainly pitch in and do whatever I can to, to make that happen. Uh, and like I said, the, the, the bright spots of going out and talking to people who are trying to get their homes built is when they mention how much help you've given them to get to where they are. So you are doing a yeoman's job. Thank you very, very much. Uh, you are making a huge difference. It's my honor, and I'm very blessed to be here helping out. Thank you so much. And I'll take a turn here, Yolanda. Everybody else is right. And I know I've talked to you privately many times, and every time I talk to people who say something nice about you, I call you, and I got to tell you how much I admire your ability to take on people's uh, issues and try so hard and take it so personally and they they can see that and that is something that is so valuable to the city that uh your ability to to convey to them that the city cares and really wants to help and thank you once again for that thank you and, sir uh, acknowledging and, all the staff for me is uh, i cannot do this without them and and i am very blessed that i have been um that i have such an amazing team and your staff works very hard. And I think that, you know, the Christmas list for you and your staff should include some more staff. So please tell us what you need. And I'm sure we will, it'll be the easiest item on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Okay. That takes us to items 2A which is communication from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction. City council may not act on these matters except to refer to matters to staff or to schedule the matters for a future agenda. Do we have any speakers, Yona? Uh, Kelsey? Yes, we have 19 speakers signed up. Our first few speakers on the list are Furman Brown, Lance Simmons, and Bill Sampson. I don't see Furman Brown in the meeting yet, so we'll try to circle back and we'll hear from Lance Simmons first. Great. Hi, Lance. Are you there? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. I want to steal a line from Brian Williams because it cuts right to the heart of an important matter at hand. I'm not a liberal or a conservative, I'm an institutionalist. I spent four decades on both the inside and outer edges of what is known as the democratic with the small d process. And what we are witnessing now at all levels of government is a perversion of democracy. We must take appropriate action to hold the purveyors of misinformation accountable. The troubling wedge issue in last year's city council race was the constant refrain of runaway corruption in city hall aimed at the city manager, and the pledge from several candidates that if elected, she would be drummed out of office without the benefit of either an investigation outlining evidence or facts 
that would substantiate or reject the accusations leveled against her. In essence, the judge, jury, and executioner resided in a highly charged set of incendiary political positions. The financial costs simply appear to be an afterthought. After all, it was other people's money. Last week, an investigation into allegations of corruption contained in an affidavit sponsored by former council member Jefferson Wagner and drafted by current council member Bruce Silverstein was found by special counsel to the city of Malibu to be completely without merit. Each allegation was resoundingly rejected and found to be, and I quote, incorrect in nearly all ma material respects and or unsubstantiated, end quote. It is a stain on the integrity of all those who collaborated upon its presentation. And I would suggest that the city council is duty bound to ensure that those who may have conspired to advance the falsehoods contained therein for political purposes exercised such poor judgment that they be held accountable by denying them the right to participate in positions of responsibility that could adversely affect the citizens whose trust they have abused. There simply is no room for lies, deceit, dishonesty, personal recriminations, poor judgment, and what amounts to a profile of cowardice that allows elected officials to hide behind manipulation of the populace through haphazard, poorly constructed, and incriminating innuendo. Whether it be through censure, sanctions, a vote of no confidence, refusal to appoint individuals to committee chairmanships, denying committee membership, or other punitive measures, those who are incapable or unwilling to accept an act to fulfill the solemn responsibilities they have been elected to carry out must be held accountable for such egregious transgressions on the public at large. This is a sad commentary indeed, but it is incumbent upon those Lance, who take their responsibility seriously to rectify yeah. this disservice that has been done to the community. Let's put the dark chapter behind us and move forward. Thank you, Lance. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Bill Sampson, followed by Doug Stewart and Andrew Wayman. Bill, are you available? Mr. Sampson. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, I, I guess I'm unmuted now, thank you. You're unmuted. Uh, am I still muted? You are not. Okay. Um, it's come to my attention that at least one loser in the most recent election, and I'm not even referring you're, to You're muffled, Bill. Can you change your oh. position relative to the mic? All right, I'm losing time, I guess. Um, how's that, is that better? Much better, thank you. Okay, uh, it's come to my attention that one loser in the last election, not even counting the immediately preceding speaker, um, has suggested that you, the council, undo the will of the voters. That smacks of what has happened nationally. That is simply the wrong thing to do. The only thing missing from the now two losers, and I think there's another one about to speak, is an allegation that Hugo Chavez has somehow sabotaged a voting machine. Mr. Silverstein's, or it wasn't even his affidavit. These were allegations by Jefferson Wagner, a longtime Malibuite. I'm informed he's a former business partner of uh, Mr. Pearson. Uh, he served this community for about 50 years. He was serving it before I got here in 1980. I believe he was serving it before any of you, most of you got here. Um, and the allegations were serious. They needed to be investigated. So fine, he had a lawyer help him with the allegations. Two criminal defense lawyers decided that the allegations could not be proven. Those lawyers spent a considerable amount of time in reviewing evidence as well they should have. I'm not sure the evidence sustains all their conclusions, but whether I agree with them or not, that is their verdict and I can live with it regardless of those disagreements. I also happened to disagree with the jury verdict in the Rittenhouse case. I just have to live with it. The ill conceived logic compelling punishment of city council people smacks of Trumpism. That's what you do. You lose the election, you get your butt kicked, 
and then you whine and create a big lie that somebody stole the election. That just didn't happen. I doubt very much that the Kenosha County District Attorney who prosecuted the Rittenhouse case is going to lose the job or losing it. The system worked. Mr. Silverstein has even said, I may not agree with all of this. I accept the decision. That's how the system is supposed to work. Let it work. You want to be vindictive? Fine. Go get in bed with Marjorie Taylor Greene and her ilk. Let the, the system's done. We're done with this. It's time to move on. I believe that even the person who you now intend to make a victim or that the losers intend to make a victim of their vindictiveness also agrees it is time to move on. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next, we have speaker, next we have Doug Stewart, followed by Andrew Wayman and Stu Walter. Hi, Doug. Are you available? I am here. Yes. Thank okay. You. Uh, well, good evening, council members. I'm Doug Stewart, a 20-year resident of Malibu. And I want to show my appreciation for the council members who took this Wagner affidavit seriously, even though it was all hearsay rumors with no evidence and few, if any, facts. You call the bluff of all those who were behind it and showed that our city is far better than they wanted everyone to believe. And I want you to know that all the people who preceded you as advocates of good and honest government who serve as electeds, volunteers, and city employees owe you a debt of gratitude for clearing reputations and bringing back respect to their dedicated service. And I also want to share some of the comments I've heard from city residents in this last week about the Wagner Affidavit. The first one was, the Wagner Affidavit is a perfect example of if you tell a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. And for me personally, I shudder that this concept from the 1920s is being used here and now. Then a lawyer friend of mine reminded me of an admonition that lawyers give clients before they testify. And that is, the only story you can keep straight is the truth. It is clear in the investigation report that many of the local interviewees could not keep the story straight. And I'll leave it at that. Then another person said, whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty, or at least innocent until you have evidence? And then finally, I received an email that read, the type of narcissistic uh, attitudes we have, we are seeing in today's indulgent world are those that are truly legends in their own minds. They're war with the ultimate power, the truth. They're setting their own rules, not defensively, but aggressively. They, they tell you what reality is and they expect you to believe it. So let me suggest what happens next. And let's look at this from the perspective of the three C's of basic leadership, competence, character, and credibility. Had the Wagner allegations been true, would not the residents of Malibu expect resignations, prosecutions, and lawsuits for those who violated the public trust? Should not the same standard to clean house, drain the swamp, be applied to those who perpetrated this farce of the Wagner affidavit and its malicious allegations on named individuals as well as the city and residents as well? The Wagner affidavit promoters, and especially now Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein, who not only drafted this worthless document but promoted it far and wide, have lost their credibility shown a true lack of character. And for Silverstein as an attorney, he was called out in the investigation report for a true lack of confidence in several instances. How can they not admit that they've lost the public's respect and quit trying to spin doctor the way out of this mess they created? For Silverstein, whether it be an emerald fraud or referral of his actions by a U.S. attorney, by a federal judge, or the Wagner affidavit, it would be best for all if he removed himself for office. Absent that, the council should not reward his behavior by allowing him to remain as mayor pro tem, represent the city in any official capacity, and certainly never be appointed as mayor. Remember, competence, character, and credibility are needed for leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Who's Our next? next? speaker, we have Andrew Wayman, followed by Stu Walter and John Armstrong. Andrew, are you available? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, I'm a full-time resident of Malibu, and uh, I want to thank you all for the good work you're able to accomplish on behalf of Malibu residents. Bruce Silverstein needs to resign from city council. His involvement in and his support of the Jefferson Wagner affidavit, as well as the harassment Silverstein perpetrated that led to Reva Feldman's resignation, are prime examples of his being unfit to serve. Mr. Silverstein was one of the parties involved in choosing the law firm that led the investigation into Wagner's allegations. 
when he didn't like the outcome of the extensive and costly investigation, he cried bias. His divisiveness and conspiracy theories have taken their toll on the city in a lot of ways. I don't want my tax dollars to be wasted on his political agenda. I don't want to see the council plummet into deep dysfunction. Mr. Silverstein should not be permitted to assume the position of mayor. If he does not resign, I urge the council to pursue every means necessary to remove Mr. Silverstein from office. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wyman. Our next speaker. Next, we have Stu Walter, followed by John Armstrong and Drew Leonard. Are you available, Mr. Walter? Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, I'm Stu Walter. I've been a, a resident of uh, Malibu since 1970. Uh, Councilman Silverstein's role is stated in the Wagner Affidavit and his allegations of non-existent corruption is unacceptable. Taxpayer funds were needlessly expended, city issues were deferred, and staff was affected in many ways. The council is already overloaded with very important issues that need to be dealt with, and their time and efforts should not be wasted on on such an issue. There should be consequences and the city council should do whatever is in their power to make an example of one who is conducting this reckless behavior. This might be a deterrent, a deterrent in preventing this from happening again. I wanna thank the city and staff for all the hard work they've been doing, especially here in Big Rock. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, sir. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is John Armstrong, followed by Drew Leonard and Bert Ross. Mr. Armstrong, are you available? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. In the 26 years I've lived in Malibu, I think the city has been well run. I've never spoken before at a city council meeting. I'm speaking tonight because I think that a dangerously toxic element has infiltrated city council, much to the detriment of Malibu. That element is Bruce Silverstein. I'm a regular reader of the Malibu Times. I read Silverstein's campaign literature, and I'm aware that he rode into town with guns blazing, declaring that he was going to be the new sheriff who would clean up corrupt city government. What has he accomplished? He harassed city manager Reva Feldman into resigning, claiming she was incompetent, if not outright corrupt. Buying out her contract cost the taxpayers of this city $300,000. He wrote Jefferson Wagner's affidavit for him. It's clear since Silverstein wrote the affidavit for Wagner that he encouraged Wagner to submit it to the authorities. In the affidavit, Wagner says a contractor tried to bribe him, but he couldn't remember who it was. The affidavit also alleges widespread corruption in city government, but doesn't cite a single instance of corruption. Silverstein insisted that the city hire a law firm to investigate these allegations. The law firm's report of its investigation, which was made public last week, cost the city in excess of $100,000. I've read the entire report. As we all know, it thoroughly debunks all of Wagner's allegations and casts serious doubts on Wagner's credibility and honesty. The investigators found zero corruption in city government. And now we know from the report in interviews that Wagner might have developed his opposition to Reva as a consequence of her repeatedly rebuffing his sexual overtures. I've also read every word of all 28 interviews that the law firm conducted. The interviews reveal that most, maybe all city employees and almost all city council members, past and present, believe that Reva Feldman was a very competent, honest city manager who was scapegoated after the Woolsey fire, as she were supposed to have put out the fire herself. It seems that Silverstein jumped into the Reva blame game in order to get himself elected to city council. The fallout from all this is not just the loss of Reva Feldman, 
but also recent, recent resignations by various other city officials who no longer care to work in a poisoned atmosphere. City government has been thrown into chaos, and there seems to be constant discord in city council. Because of its arrogance, bullying, and apparent lack of ability to separate fact from fiction, I entreat city council to vote against allowing Silverstein to rotate into the role of, mayor, of Malibu's next mayor. Moreover, for the good of Malibu, I urge Silverstein to resign from city council altogether. It's time to restore decency and reason to local government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Drew Leonard, followed by Burt Ross and Lloyd Ahern. Hi, Drew, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Having read the report and the accompanying notes, I'm disappointed that what has transpired to the residents of Malibu. The city has been dragged through a dark drama of lies and accusations with a hatchet job of Revit Feldman as its finale. After the Jefferson Wagner affidavit was released, Bruce should have stepped back and waited for the investigation results. Instead, Bruce chose to double down and harass Reva until she was bought out of her contract. Then Bruce and the no de development at any cost contingency of Malibu tried to promote Jefferson Wagner as Reva's replacement. Having read the report, talk about a poor potential decision. Now Bruce is questioning the bias of the attorney he helped choose and oversaw to do the investigation. His, his reckless actions have cost Malibu taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. This behavior needs to be addressed. This appears to be a pattern everywhere Bruce goes, including Florida and Delaware, resulting in his employers having to make huge payouts to clean up his messes. Bruce's tactics are dragging Malibu through the gutter. What qualified person would want to work for the city of Malibu with all this instability? It is apparent that Bruce Silverstein should resign or should be censored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Burt Ross, followed by Lloyd Ahern and Michael McDonald. Mr. Ross, are you available? Is that all right? Yeah. Bert, are you there? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Mayor Grassani and members of the council, my name is Bert Ross, and as mayor of Fort Lee, New Jersey, I was offered a half million dollar bribe, reported it to the United States attorney the following morning, worked with the FBI and wore a wire on three separate occasions, and based upon my testimony, seven people, including two members of the mafia, were sentenced to prison. I guess you could say I saw political corruption up close and firsthand. I have now lived in Malibu for 10 years, and the only corruption I have witnessed or heard about here in Malibu is that which has been concocted and fabricated by you, Mr. Silverstein, and Jefferson Wagner. I read the just-released report on corruption, and it appears that the two of you conspired to create a cloud of corruption over City Hall for the express purpose of getting rid of then-city manager Reva Feldman. Your motive, Mr. Silverstein, was twofold, revenge and ambition. You were angry with Reva Feldman because after the Woolsey fire, she allowed SEE to park their equipment on a field which impacted the view from your home. And you realized in this day of cynicism, you could pitch yourself as the great crusader, the white knight against corruption, and thus win a seat on this very council. You accomplished both of your goals and in the process hurt innocent people, brought disgrace to the very community you were elected to serve, and cost us, the taxpayers, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Your reaction to the report is blatantly dishonest. You say you never wanted the report to find corruption, but merely to clear the air from the very stench that you yourself created. And then you go on to question the bias of the reputable attorneys who prepared the report, the very attorneys whom you yourself selected. You, Mr. Silverstein, have no shame nor any decency. You sit on the council simply because you conned the many people who believed you when you promised to eradicate corruption, which you yourself created in your own mind. You should resign, but you are too arrogant to do so. But I urge this council to censure you for your conduct and to remove you as mayor pro tem. You should never serve as mayor of this community, which you have disgraced. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Who do we have now? Our next speaker is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Michael McDonald and Joe Drummond. 
Thank you, Lloyd. Are you there? Yeah. Uh, good evening, City Council. My name is Lloyd Ahern, and I want you to just focus on this one thing to begin with. Bruce has been in office for one year, almost to the day. It seems like he's been here for 40 years. In one year, he managed to have four executives of our city, all females, resign. They just couldn't stand it, and they left. He, in the process of this, God only knows what he thinks. It cost the city $400,000. Uh, 300000 for the payoff for Riva and 100000 to the, to the to the firm on the Jefferson Wagner thing. Um, he's been, he, he came here kind of on probation anyway, because he was in that jewel debacle he used to talk about. Um, and then you censored him and said, you couldn't be, um, you couldn't be pro Tim. And, uh, you tried to get Steve to do it. And then, and then that's how, uh, Paul ended up as, as the mayor. So he should be now go back on probation again, and you should find a way to move him out of his job as pro tem right now and 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 put Steve in there. Steve has the same political friends thing, so they can they can't say, well, we got robbed of our choice of thing because they're pretty much close. Steve is a gentleman and knows how to conduct himself as as mayor. If you guys have to go and get a new city manager in this day and age of 50-50 male female candidates. I don't know how you can get a female candidate to come here. And how can you promise them that he won't go after her and do what he did to them? And with Lisa gone, it's it's just too dangerous. And at a certain point, we just go, you know, after a while, it's not Bruce's fault. It becomes our fault. We have to really pound on each other and say, listen, Bruce has got to be neutralized. So I hope you do what everybody's suggesting. It sounds like a good crowd you got there. And please, let's save ourselves from Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahern. Our next speaker is Michael McDonald, followed by Joe Drummond and Craig Hill. Are you there, Mr. McDonald? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. We can hear you. Okay, good, thanks. So I don't know if a mechanism exists whereby a sitting city council member can be removed, but based on Bruce Silverstein's December 9th, 2021 guest column called Clean Bill of Health in the Malibu Times, there certainly needs to be one. Regarding the current health of the city, we have a malignant tumor and its name is Bruce Silverstein. If Bruce Silverstein acknowledged even one shred of responsibility for putting all of us through the Jefferson Wagner affidavit expensive nightmare. I might have cut him some slack, but he didn't. Not one shred, even though he appears to have been not just an enabler, but the architect of it. He exhibited zero contrition, zero embarrassment, zero grace, zero integrity. If the cancer can't be removed, perhaps it can be put into remission. I respectfully request the city council to vote to censure Bruce Silverstein, strip him of his committee appointments, and make sure he never represents our city as mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Craig Hill and Howard Redsky. Thank you, Joe. Are you available? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Honorable Mayor Grisanti and City Council, I finished reading the interviews solicited by the attorneys, attorneys hired to investigate former Mayor Wagner's affidavit today and found it unsatisfactory and incomplete for all the time and money invested. I wonder if anyone who has spoken out against Bruce Silverstein tonight has actually read it accurately. For reasons unknown, it includes a full tangent vacation from investigating corruption in Malibu. Why almost 200 pages of a 472 page document consisting of a 20 year old police case about a shooting in a different city and state where no illegal charges were found for someone who wasn't even involved in the affidavit, nor was he interviewed is absolutely bizarre. This was unjustified and unnecessary and failed at the important task of unsealing the documents supporting the claim to, to allow the raid on the home of former mayor. 
They were dismissive to the, re to the real issues and evidence given in testimony, for example, separation agreements between staff who had an inappropriate behavior or even evidence presented by residents like myself. They focused 23 more times attention on this rather than to a more worthy witness such as Christy Hogan. And they gave zero consideration to solid evidence of corruption in the permits department by certain resident witnesses and did not follow up on Richard Mullica or Bruce Silverstein's suggestions and interviews. And why wasn't building inspector Mark Bowling or Jessica Colbert or the Sheldon person identified in the report interviewed? The city staff and Reva Feldman knew that Wagner was being investigated, but gave him no warning to defend himself, which seems unfair and hostile in itself. He was guilty before even proven innocent, even if, when it should have been the other way around, especially for a former mayor who ended up being cleared of all charges. And also to include insults and character assassinations without evidence of people supporting Wagner who were and were not interviewed is irresponsible and wrong. Why does it state so often that preserving Malibu is such a bad thing over overdevelopment? What was the goal of this investigation? It seemed to have missed the point completely. At times, all these interviewees believed that their testimony would be confidential. And now that it is out, it seems to tarnish almost everyone's record and puts the city in a bad light. It's no wonder people with solid information would not come forward. With regards to Reva Feldman and her choice to leave the city, it's unfortunate that she was the fall guy for the Woolsey fire debacle, but she was in charge. No one council member should be made responsible for her departure, which much of the city rallied behind finding her responsible, whether it was her fault or not. Communication obviously failed during the fire, and that was her responsibility. Someone should have been assigned to the command center with the fire department and dispatched firefighting to our residents. This would have prevented so many homes from burning back down that Yolanda is struggling with. Also, the investigators watched the farewell to Reva video. Why? That was unauthor unauthorized use of time, time and funds for the attorney. This shows how city staff was steering the investigation. There are still many stones left unturned. I hope the investigation has opened the eyes of possible wrongdoings in the city and that this type of corruption does not continue. I don't believe oh, this report of, is of a standard that suits the great Thank city you, analogy. Thanks. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Howard Rudsky and Ryan. Hi, Craig. Are you available? I am. Good evening, everybody. I'd, I'd hope to talk about the stoplight at the Beach Inn, and, and maybe Rob Dubow will talk about that when he comes up to bat. But uh, in the meantime, I'm, I just have to say, wow, what th th there's so much misinformed vitriol directed at Bruce, a lot of sniping at the messenger. It's a common misconception that he ran on kicking out Riva. No, he ran on finding the truth. People were asking a lot of questions and he said he'd try to get answers. So he started asking the questions at the city and Riva gave him a lot of pushback. That raised my eyebrows at that point. I, I wondered why so much pushback? Why not just give the answers? And I don't know, and it's not my role to form conclusory opinions about it all, but the body language suggested the, at least the possibility of skeletons in the closet. So now onto the report itself. Unfortunately, it really isn't much of an investigation. It's more an editorialized transcript of witness testimony accompanied by unsupported and ad hominem opinions as to the credibility of the witnesses with little exploration of the content of the assertions. They left a lot of loose threads hanging. So, you know, it's, they didn't look very hard, so it's not surprising that they didn't find anything. And at this point, I don't see that there's much to be done except to try to learn something from it and move on. And certainly attacking Bruce is entirely beside the point. To, uh, it seems the one exception worth emphasizing is the breach of confidentiality. Wherever that might lead to damages, the city may be on the hook. And I and a lot of people assumed you voted to release the attorney's notes, their work product, not the entire witness testimony, and I have to ask now, could you not foresee that the main effect would be to stoke the animosity around town? And, and I mean, it's in retrospect, it seems sort of obvious. And, uh, you know, I hope nobody intended that we would reach this kind of point. Anyway, there's so many mind boggling things from beginning to end. I wish I could be helping you think of a remedy on this, but I haven't yet. So at this point, all I can say is good luck and thank you for the time. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Howard Rudsky, followed by Ryan and Barry Haldeman. Howard, are you available? Unmute. I am. Couldn't let me unmute. Well, You're on mute. Evening. 
Good evening, Mayor and City Council. <clears throat> wow. The report, I read it. I don't believe there's evidence to substantiate the allegations. All of us that love and care about Malibu should read the report and interviews with participants for themselves and come up with their own conclusions, not what the people that always talk at the council and planning meetings are saying like tonight. Form your own opinions. Don't get them from social media or other people. Read it. It's your obligation. It's our city. We all together have to make the decision, not just 19 of us tonight. You know, this is not a sampling of thousands of people in the city. The city council needs to hear from the thousands of us that vote. You know, all of us read it. It's our obligation. This report, as far as I can figure, cost the city probably close to $600,000 when you add everything up. Staff time, legal fees, payouts, <coughs> reports, etc. You know, between $500 and $1,000 an hour for our legal team and theirs doesn't come cheap. You know, it's just the money could have been used for the things we really care about. School separation, homeless crisis, new violent crime in our city, Woolsey fire victims, ball fields, skate parks, local businesses that still need help recovering from the fire and the pandemic. You know, it, the ill will this thing has caused, the amount of staff that's resigned with experience, historical knowledge, relationships with outside agencies and government entities that could help the very valuable issues and things that we want. You know, <clears throat> you know, this is the time that all Malibu citizens should take responsibility. I feel, read the report, tell, your, tell the city council by email, text, phone calls, what you think and tell them you know, what you think they should do, you know, because what I believe in these 19 people believe is great. We all believe it, but we, they need to hear from all of us. Like when we had the zoning issue, we got three or 400 people to show up. We need that kind of support right now to make sure that they know what we want. And I believe we should take swift action so this never happens again. And the perpetrators are not allowed to do this. But the city needs to hear from all of you. And one last thing, because I know I'm running out of time. I think the staff needs an appreciation day. I think we need to tell them, because you saw with Yolanda tonight, that woman is like a Thank superhuman you. being. Howard, Thank you, Howard. You. All right. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Barry Haldeman and John Mazza. Hi, Ryan, are you available? Uh, Yes, and um, I'm surprised. I, I would like the city manager to explain exactly how much money Reva got and why. And I guess she didn't get a job anywhere else. That was one of the triggers the council crafted in the separation agreement for Reva Feldman. And maybe it was an intended gift on your council member's part. Um, but the other part was that it was explained that this was a settlement of sorts and that the city's paid for 150000 of it. And lastly, the appropriation for this investigation was 50,000, not a hundred. So I'd like to figure out what's going on there. I read nearly every page of these 472 uh, pages. And I get that the newspaper media and even some of the members of the city are commenting based on the summary of the report and not the 472 pages and the interviews actually conducted. However, I read those interviews and this is a half ass report. They didn't uh, follow up on the leads that were given to them. My name was mentioned twice in this report on different pages. Nobody ever called me from this group. I told you that before. I, I cannot fathom that. Nobody interviewed the uh, city clerk, Lisa Pope nor Vic Peterson, the building official at the time. You know, nobody interviewed C.C. Woods. What about the building, uh, I'm sorry, the planner, Jessica Colvard? She's not interviewed. 
What about Lloyd Ahern? He has a lot to say. Why wasn't he interviewed? What about the planner, Adrian Fernandez? He might know something. Why was he not interviewed? He's a paid city official. Why was he not interviewed? Why wasn't Sharon Borofsky identified in the report? Why wasn't she contacted or interviewed? There was a mention in there when these people were contacted if they were not interviewed and um, it said Jay Katz. Uh, well, they had to correct the report because they were wrong about that. And there was written proof that they were wrong and they had to amend their own report. This report, it's, it's like a screenplay, but we saw the movie. This isn't what happened. Um, the lack of investigating is atrocious. I don't know if you should pay them, in my opinion. Go back and what is, was the assignment? To do web searches on various uh, out-of-state people? Um, that was a grand waste of, of time. And it looks like they blew all the money and the time and decided to say, we haven't found it yet, but the report, we ran out of money and it's time to, you know, they didn't get it on a silver platter. So they went Ryan, home. That's your time. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Barry Haldeman, followed by John Maza and Rick Mullen. Barry, are you available? I am. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay. It's finally time to speak out. I've been here since the beginning of the city and was involved in a group that delivered a thousand people to the Board of Supervisors so we could get a city. We formed the city to get away from the backstabbing, name-calling, and underhanded politics of the county, especially against Malibu. For a while, we were successful, although not everyone was happy. They never are. But last election, a cloud descended on the city. Serious allegations of fraud, bribery, backroom politics, all the things we wanted to get away from were used as campaign tactics, way beyond normal campaign rhetoric. The city manager was called a Nazi. The actions and morals of the city attorney were called into question. And as a result, as people have mentioned, at least four officials who are all women have left the city. And um, I'm not sure how we're going to get them back. And the campaign worked. Bruce Silverstein was elected. And to prove a point, he assisted Jefferson Wagner in writing a sworn affidavit listing a number of allegations which at best were hearsay, something Mr. Silverstein, as a litigator, well knew. That caused the city to form a task force of Mr. Silverstein and Councilperson Farrar to lead an investigation uh, using outside independent counsel to investigate. And per Mr. Silverstein in print, the investigation was proper and led by independent individuals. But at the same time, he felt they were biased. So although he uh, supervised the investigation, he uh, asked for the investigation, was involved along the way, he's already tearing down this investigation. And I predict he will continue to tear it down bit by bit and will target any of us who question his motives. How stupid do people think we are? Having used McCarthyism tactics to become elected, he now wants to benefit from them. And I feel personally that Mr. Silverstein does not have the character to re represent our city. If he chooses to stay on as council member, he, he has to learn back and teach us to trust him. I'm not sure he can do that. So I think that the council should not allow him to become mayor. That would send the wrong message as to who we are in Malibu and what this city represents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Our next speaker is John Mazza, followed by Rick Mullen and Scott Dietrich. Hi, John, are you available? Yep, I just got on. Well, I'm amazed at what I'm hearing. Uh, Bruce, Bruce introduced an investigation into what Jefferson Wagner said. What came back was, a political smear on virtually everybody in Malibu that disagrees with the pro-development uh, city council members. And it was a smear. Uh, 
There is nothing in this report that proves that what he alleged did not happen. It just proves that they could not prove it. Okay, that's not guilty in America. Now, listen to what the Pro Development Council member said. Karen, Karen Farrar, who ran on, I'm going to protect Malibu, I believe in the general plan. She said it was all the whole food, quote, these are quotes, whole food crowds, uh, uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, John Mazza leads the conspiracy theorists. Uh, Ozzy Silner was a conspiracy theorist. Sam L. Kaplan's an extremist. These are all quotes. And listen to this, that it maligns people in Malibu who are relatively disadvantaged people who bought property when Malibu was years ago. Okay, the old timers are bad people, boy, they're conspiracists. Um, I, I personally have many violations on my home. My home was built in 1949. I haven't touched it, okay? Uh, it's a lie. I mean, she lied, okay? Now, when you malign people, and you malign people like Jefferson Wagner, who people trust, you line everybody at Malibu, they're going to trust Jefferson Wagner a lot more than Paul Grassani. Paul Grassani said, uh, I have low regard for the truth. I have no logic. Uh, I have no, a low opinion of Maz's integrity. Um, he is a radi, radi, radical anti-development agenda. And I've approved more than a thousand projects in the Planning Commission. Paul, and then he, he, he maligns my reputation. I was a uh, CFO for a, a New York Stock Exchange firm for years. Never got busted. Paul got his license pulled. Okay. Mikey comes around and says, party and no. Uh, I worked for Zuma J. I worked with Zuma J. And I saw him cheating. Well, he was part of the business. He didn't turn in this supposed ATM thie thievery, uh, credit card fraud. Why didn't he? Okay. This goes on and on and on and on through this report. Not one fact disproves anything in that affidavit. It just says we cannot prove it. So this is going to be settled in the next election. There's three uh, development people who have belied the fact that they claim. Thank you very That's much, John. Time. Our next speaker is Rick Mullen, followed by Scott Dietrich. Hi, Rick. Are you available? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I read the report on our Wagner affidavit, and I want to thank you for doing it and for releasing it also. This affidavit and Jefferson's encouragement of Bruce Silverstein to run on a platform of firing the city manager is what I refer to as the dark legacy, the dark, sad, dark legacy of Jefferson Wagner. Part of this legacy, which is still unfolding, is the departure of the city manager, the city clerk, and now, I understand, the assistant city manager. The city attorney was all going to retire anyway, I think probably moved it up, I suspect, her departure date. Jefferson Schuyler and I ran on a platform of returning the mission statement to the center of the city council decision making. We did not run on a platform of firing the city manager, city attorney, or anyone. We were very successful overall in doing what we said we would do. The biggest achievement was the land purchase from the Malibu Bay Company, which provides an illustrative example. Here's a few facts about that purchase. One, if we followed Jefferson's insistence that the city purchase a smaller property for top dollar, we would not have had the funds to make the Bay Company purchase. Two, the acquisition was not an easy one and was negotiated by Christy Hogan, our long-serving city attorney. They originally insisted on selling all the lots together, but she was able to convince them to sell what we could afford. Three, we were able to do it because we're in a strong financial position, which was the result of Excellent management by Reva Feldman and Lisa Solder. Four, the city manager was also able to secure the necessary financing because of the city's sterling credit rating, which they had managed for many years. This was probably the most significant preservation accomplishment in Malibu's history. It was voted on by all the council members, but it was executed, as everything in the city is, is by the full-time professionals, by Christy Hogan, Reva Feldman, Lisa Solger, 
none of whom will be working for the residents of Malibu any longer. The people who paid the price of all the unnecessary acrimony generated by Jefferson and his endorsement of Bruce Silverstein were the hardworking full-time professionals who make everything in Malibu work. In the end, they will find new employment where I know they'll be appreciated for the fine professionals that they are. The residents of Malibu are the ones who will pay the long-term price of this ongoing exit of our city professionals. For me, it was an honor to serve the people of Malibu, and it was an honor to serve with all of the full-time professionals of the Malibu staff. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, and then we'll see if we can circle back to the person we missed earlier. Thank you so much. Scott, are you available? I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, if we, those people who are most active in the city, continue to tear each other down with this kind of personal attack, we will get nowhere. It's got to stop. I know that there was an orchestrated, there has been an orchestrated campaign to get Bruce recalled or fired or whatever you say that's been going on. And we heard those voices speak tonight earlier, especially disappointing people who I th ran for city council and intend to run again. Now, the council, all five of you voted to go forward to investigate the allegations by uh, Jefferson Wagner, former mayor, former count, two-time councilman. I had heard, and my name's in this report confidentially, but of course it's now released, that some of the allegations, I could not, and I stated at the time, they asked twice and I said at the time, I don't remember. But these investigators define that as, oh, it must be false because people don't agree on the same timeline. That causes me to very much doubt this report in general. It just doesn't make any sense. Secondly, I have known Jefferson Wagner for someplace between 35 and 40 years, and I do believe he's honest. I believe he's always acted in the best interest of Malibu. Clearly, He's anti-development. Some people disagree with that, but that's his position. And Bruce ran on not necessarily getting rid of Reva per se, but as an anti-development candidate. Reva was the target because she had failed us, I believe, in the Woolsey fire. She went along with Chief Osby and the fire chiefs when they said, what a wonderful job they did. However, I don't think that's the case. I think they blew it. And there, and there's a number of reasons I think Reva had to go. Other people really liked Reva. That's fine. We can have that disagreement. But remember, Bruce won. And with a clear majority, based on his desire to have Reva leave, and then she would not re cooperate with him. And that started the battle. So at this point, I just plead with people, let's not tear each other apart. That's not going to help anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I still don't see Furman Brown in the meeting, and I don't see any raised hands in Zoom either. So that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Do we have any commission or committee updates? Yes, we have Scott Dietrich signed up to give a commission update. Hi, Scott. Do you have a commission update that <laughs> is not back. about something we are that is agendized tonight? I am here. Um, maybe Lance is still on as well, but uh, from Public Works, if there are any questions regarding um, 6A, and thank you for moving it, I'm here. Thank you very much. We will call on you when we get to 6A. Uh, do we have a city manager update? Steve, yes, are you? Do. Good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, yes, first, I just wanted to um, thank and acknowledge uh, our building official, Yolanda Bundy, for the presentation on the Woolsey Fire Rebuilds. 
Thank you for that very informative presentation. Um, I don't have too long to report tonight. Uh, city is preparing for what appears to be a rather significant uh, winter rainstorm coming. Uh, public works crews are on standby and they have been out ensuring that storm drains are clear, and taking other protective actions. Uh, we are expecting to see the heaviest rainfall around midnight this evening and expecting into the day tomorrow. Uh, we've seen predictions uh, from anywhere from one and a half to up to three inches or more in the local mountains. Uh, so we are getting ready for the uh, potential of having to respond to some debris flow and keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, the good news is that uh, we have been seeing the, um, the fire threat uh, reducing uh, as it has stayed cool uh, and the live fuel moisture has been creeping up and hopefully with this storm uh, will get us um, out of any significant fire danger for this year. Just want a reminder that um, residents, businesses, students, or employees in Malibu are urged to sign up if they want to receive alerts from the city uh, via text or email. You can go to the city's website at malibu.org slash news and you can uh, choose which emergency alerts you would like to receive. Uh, just a reminder, if we do have a real disaster with an imminent threat to life and property, the city uses Everbridge, which is like a reverse 911, so you don't need to be signed up to that. Uh, that is blasted out to uh, everybody, uh, and you do not require a subscription to that. Lastly, I just wanted to wish everybody, uh, since this is the last regular city council meeting of the year, just wanted to wish everybody a, uh, set, a safe but festive holiday season, uh, and uh, please be safe on the road uh, as you as we wind down 2021. Uh, we'd like to see you all back in 2022. Uh, that's the extent of my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. I don't see any questions. Uh, is Jim Braden in the in the audience today? I believe I saw him here earlier, Mr. Mayor. I do see him. Just give us a moment to get him unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for joining us. I have to have a little eye procedure today, so I'm just going to skip the picture. The uh, um, I'll start off with uh, we had a fatality incident down by Bush Drive. Um, that was on Thursday. The um, in the morning hours right around six o'clock. The, uh, it's actually being investigated at this point is the suicide. And the, uh, there was a uh, video footage obtained from the truck the driver was operating at the time of the accident. And uh, so it's being handled by our homicide at this time. As far as the uh, Tuna Canyon incident with the uh, machete attack that occurred. Hey, it was in the county area, but uh, about a mile north of PCH. The uh, In the last uh, week, we received approximately four other reports of different assaults, not all with a machete, but all involving the same individual. So on... Uh, They've had several operations up in that area looking for this person. The uh, major crimes and also our special weapons teams were up there on Friday. They took another individual into custody that was living back in that same approximate area. And he was uh, hospitalized for mental issues. The uh, um, Other than those two incidents, we've been having... Uh, extra patrols through shopping areas and things, just like all the smash and grab robberies and everything else. We've been lucky so far in Malibu, but we continue to monitor the centers and be cognizant of that. And uh, we continue to work with the host team and go back through some of these areas where homeless encampments were cleared out and making sure they remain cleared out. And like I said before, 
feel free to call us if you see something repopulating or something. We'll get people right on it and, and have them move back out of there. So, and with that, any questions you may have, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Jim. And I want to apologize for failing to call on you at the na the last meeting we had in November. And that's okay. Oh, that's fine, Paul. Let me bring up the one other uh, other thing. The only thing I wanted to comment on that day was it's a very, very serious issue when those cell towers go down in Malibu. And it's not just for fire danger. If someone has an accident along the highway or any other type of situation where they need help immediately, the it's hindered. And literally, it could cost someone their life. So that's something that really needs to be looked into. And uh, because having a 21-mile 21, 21 stretch of city where there's very little cell reception, uh, it, it's like the recipe for disaster. So, Thank you for emphasizing that. Yeah. And we appreciate everything your guys are doing for us. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Paul. And same as the city manager said, everybody have a good holiday season. And uh, we'll stay on all these different topics and events and, and uh, try to mitigate issues in the city for you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Now we're at city council subcommittee reports, mayor and city council meeting attendance reports and inquiries. Who would like to present their council member report? The hands are deafening. Oh, Mikey, you're up. I don't really want to, but that's just what happens here. I'm exhausted by this. I'm not going to lie to you. And as busy as I've been with city-related activities, the only thing I'm really going to take time to respond to is just the flood of correspondence I've received from people concerning the Wagner Affidavit Report. And by the way, I want to say great comments, Rick. You really put some stuff in perspective there. I think the core of my message is, is that we have to be better than this. We are better than this. Malibu is better than this. Certainly, this is a very dark chapter for the city of Malibu. But the truth is, nothing's changed. If you believe the city is corrupt, if you believe in conspiracy theories, that hasn't changed. If you knew the charges brought forward in the affidavit were false from the beginning, you still know that now. So hundreds of thousands of dollars later and a huge amount of infighting and dysfunction with the city council, with us sitting right here, and I feel like we've made absolutely no progress. And none of this surprises me. The psychology of a conspiracy theory, which I believe this is, is that proof that the conspiracy is false is just part of the conspiracy. I would say John Maza's recent public comments are proof of that. It doesn't matter who the city manager is or who the department heads are. In the view of John and apparently others, we are corrupt. No evidence offered or apparently needed. And it's remark like, remarks like this that it grinds the city to a halt, has the staff heading for the door. Remarks like that are toxic and unfair to hardworking and truly excellent staff. And it's been said, but this is just a disturbing trend we've been in. You know, we have a counselor, Bruce, that comes from a background, escaping federal charges, it appears, and millions of dollars his firm was sued for, and apparently was the last person to believe in a fraudulent emerald scheme. Come on. Then he goes to war against the city, including drafting the Wagner Affidavit without transparent or transparency on that, apparently, until it's revealed. When the interview notes, when I went through them, yeah, they're ugly, totally ugly. You said you found Jefferson's claims credible. To me, it just puts your judgment again into serious question. You trusted hearsay. And I would hope for more from someone who ran on a platform being a lawyer. 
maybe more discouraging to me is that all after all that's happened, it seems like you're trying to play off the affidavit and the investigation as some sort of worthy exercise and that the investigators you recommended might not have gotten it quite right. No apology for the waste of time and money. No real attempts to unify Malibu and move forward. It just feels like business as usual. In my opinion, to be successful as an elected official, people must trust you. Every one of us up here. And right now, I'm hearing a lot of voices that don't feel that way at all. I'm hearing for calls for you to resign and more. I'm hearing anger. I'm hearing from a city where the majority appear to be tired of this BS. I agree. I'm exhausted by it. We have real work to do. In my opinion, if you had a true sense, Bruce, of self-introspection on the damage you've done, you would behave with far more character. I suspect you won't, and this whole chapter in our city's history has just been a divisive, destructive, expensive, and toxic, giant waste of time. When we have real issues we should be focusing on, focusing on, as Yolanda detailed for us tonight. I started my comments by saying that we need to be better than this and that we are better than this. And right now, I'm guessing that some or all of the candidates that we are interviewing on Thursday for our permanent city manager position are listening to, uh, uh, listening to us tonight. And I want to say to you, we are better than this. Malibu is an amazing city with great residents that are passionate about our environment, our lifestyle, and embrace our mission statement. The majority of us want and need someone to help us move forward successfully into the future. We are excited to work with a dynamic leader, and I look forward to meeting you all on Thursday. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mikey. Karen, I see your hand. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I will start out with a couple of things because uh, there is still some work going on. Um, I and several others from the city and from the school district separation team attended the Laco County Committee meeting on December 8th. I want to really, really thank the dozen or so community members who signed up and spoke. We've got to keep our voices there in front of the county committee and in front of the school district. And I just want everybody to know I appreciate them paying attention and making the effort and taking the time, making the time to do that. Uh, the school district separation uh, committee, ad hoc committee, had a team meeting on Friday, and we are really trying to focus on the work at hand and new things are being thrown at us all the time. It's complicated, it's a long process and I wanna thank Christine Wood, Elizabeth Shabelson, my ad hoc committee uh, co-member, Mikey Pearson and, and Steve McClary, everybody who's working on it. But what has taken up most of my time recently? No coincidence the sad state of affairs with the release of this report on the Jefferson Wagner affidavit. I wanna thank all of the public speakers tonight. Um, John Mazeth seems to think I have a disregard for quote unquote old timers. I've lived here 44 years. Does that make me an old timer? Maybe. And I'm not calling anybody old, but I will say if you added up the number of years that the speakers tonight have lived here in Malibu, it's in the hundreds, many hundreds. So, so there we are. And you heard what most of them had to say. The report speaks for itself. The document listed many serious allegations of illegal activity in City Hall, not one of which was found to have any merit. So now hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars have been squandered. And for what? so that Bruce Silverstein could declare that the city had a clean bill of health. What's next? The search for Bigfoot? How else might that money have been used? We heard from Yolanda Bundy tonight, but before I heard her report, I was already thinking about it. 
increased code enforcement, increased law enforcement, more staff positions filled in any number of areas, perhaps in the city clerk's department, planning, building and safety, more full-time inspectors. We heard it all from Yolanda tonight and we all know what the needs are. Bruce, you ran for office on a platform. The three words are ringing in my head, transparency, ethics and accountability. So ironic. As far as, many, as I and many others are concerned, you have embodied the exact opposite of every one of these adjectives. A look at the misuse of an already overburdened staff, a staff described by the soon to be former assistant city manager not long ago as underwater. They can't keep up. Bruce, you submitted 35 public records requests to the city clerk between November 2020 and April 2021. Those requests, perhaps otherwise described as a fishing expedition, resulted in the production of thousands and thousands of documents. I've been told as many as 10,000. Is anyone curious as to why just this evening we are going to approve the minutes from meetings last April, seven months ago. The public records requests, along with the drastic increase in special meetings needed just to get through regular business is why. I do wonder how many city councils can manage to meet for six to seven hours per meeting on a regular basis only to make it through half their agenda. The wheels of City Hall are, as Mikey said, grinding to a halt. There's enough work to be done under normal circumstances without this absurd mission to dismantle operations at City Hall as they have been going for the last 30 years. And as for a current planning commissioner, John Mazza, who spoke tonight, referring to the staff as cockroaches, in his interview in the affidavit, that is an outrage. An apology is due to the staff. Dedicated city team members working under increasingly difficult circumstances and plummeting morale. It's no wonder that in the past year, the city has lost its city manager, city attorney, who had announced she was going to retire, but I am sure left ahead of her planned schedule. City clerk, and now, as we learned on Friday, assistant city manager, the central nervous system of city finances and operations. What does that say about the level of toxicity at Malibu City Hall as a place to work these days? It is shameful and unprecedented. People working in good faith, insulted and demeaned by one of their own commissioners. I'll say it like somebody else did tonight. Wow. As I said in a recent interview in the Malibu Times, in my opinion, you can't read this report without having at the forefront of your mind that Bruce ran for office on a platform of something akin to draining the swamp. I don't know if he used those exact words, but now that all of these allegations have been found to be false, it sounds like his entire campaign platform was based on a fraud. What was the swamp to be drained if all of this was not true? And Doug Stewart's quote tonight, yes, the same person that sent it to him sent it to me at the same time. That's a quote from Dr. George Simon, an author and nationally known expert on narcissists and manipulators. Bruce, sadly and tragically, I have found you to exhibit intelligence and insight at times. I have not disagreed with everything you've ever offered from your seat on the dais. At the very least, you've exhibited cleverness. Your choice to use your talents to destroy the city is a real shame for the constituents and the staff. In the ideal world, 
you would have the decency to resign. But this is the real world, and I don't think you'll do that. It's up to the people of Malibu to decide what should happen, and I trust they will. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, you're next, followed by Steve. Thanks, Paul. I put my hand up ahead of Steve because I, my connection keeps bouncing, and I just wanted to talk before I get kicked off again. So I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna talk about this stuff tonight at all. Honestly, first, first of all, I, I didn't encourage and I don't encourage the speakers who, um, came on tonight and said negative, somewhat nasty things about other council members. Um, I, I don't encourage people to do that. I don't want to see that being done. Um, but I'm not in control of other people. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I don't share the sentiments that were um, shared tonight. I have to say that after hearing comments from my fellow council people, I'm not sure I made the right decision there, but I, I'm, I, I'm going to stay with the high road there. You know, we heard from 12 speakers tonight calling for my head, then plus, I guess, Mikey and Karen. Um, three of the, uh, to a, to a person, they were people who opposed my election. Every single one of them, vocally, publicly. They also the exact same people who came here with, with, with one or two exceptions. There were some additions tonight, but they're the same people that came here week after week with pitchforks after the election. Um, notwithstanding that, 2,400 people voted for me and they voted for me based on my running on a platform that was very transparent about what my platform was. So I, you know, I really don't care about you 12 people who show up and say the same thing over and over again. Don't. Um, land, and th three of them, one third of them, I'm sorry, one quarter of them are the people who lost the election, who ran in the election. Mark Wetton had decency to keep his mouth shut tonight after sending his first letter and asking that I resign and arguing that I should be censured. So that's, that's more, more like a, a third of them then. Let me set some things straight. I did not run on a platform of asserting that anyone committed any crime or was corrupt. I certainly didn't run on a platform of asserting that that was true of the for now former city manager. I defy any of you, rather than going on what you think occurred, to go back and read what I said, watch recordings of what I said, read the newspaper articles that you referred to, you find a single statement by me to the effect that I thought the former city manager committed a crime or was corrupt. I defy you to find that. I had reasons for the view that I espoused that the city manager should be terminated as a matter of discretion by the city council. I can't repeat those reasons right now because the city council agreed to a separation agreement, which includes a non-disparagement clause that doesn't allow me to defend myself when it comes to those matters. But I defy you to find the statement that you've all attributed to me. It's been said that Jefferson Wagner encouraged me to run on a platform of firing city manager. That's not true. You don't know what Jefferson spoke to me about during the campaign, but that was not what he encouraged me to do. That came from elsewhere, okay? It wasn't from Jefferson who I still believe is an honorable man with great integrity and who didn't say a single thing that was dishonest. Now, the affidavit. Uh, I didn't know about a single thing that was alleged in that affidavit until after the election was over and Jefferson spoke to me about those things for the very first time. He had not mentioned those things to me before the election was over. After the election was over, he gave me a stack of documents that he said evidenced corruption. I reviewed those documents and I didn't find anything. And I told him that. He then related to me various things that he said he knew. I didn't assess the credibility of his assertions. That's also another falsehood. And I saw that in the attorney's report notes of my interview where it says that I found Jefferson's assertions credible. I didn't find them credible. I didn't find them incredible. I didn't view it to be my responsibility to determine whether they were credible or not credible. The litmus test that I employed, and I explained this to the lawyers, was 
If Jefferson said something which, if true, would amount to a crime or corruption, that's something that should be looked into. Jefferson said a lot of things that, even if true, wouldn't amount to a crime or corruption. And I eliminated all of them from what I explained to him he should go ahead and say publicly. I told him that if he was going to make these assertions and he wanted me to back him by asking for an investigation, he had to put him in a sworn affidavit. And I prepared that affidavit for him based on everything he said to me, excluding the things that I thought were noise. And, you know, any, anyone who thinks that people, lay people, prepare affidavits on their own and submit them doesn't understand how the legal system works. Lawyers write affidavits. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how affidavits are created. And I have legal experience. So I put what Jefferson's, Jefferson's words, I put them in legal terms and I wrote them out. And then he read them, he made some changes, and he swore to those allegations. They're not my allegations. They're the allegations of Jefferson Wagner, a two-time former mayor, a two-time former city council member, who I believe most of the residents of the city have a lot of respect for and find to be a man of integrity and honor, notwithstanding some of the sniping that was made by, at him by other council members in their interviews. I've been accused of being a misogynist, of gender-based discrimination. Well, you all voted to have an investigation of me to determine whether that was true. I am not at liberty to discuss whether that, whether that investigation is concluded and what, if anything, if it is concluded, it has determined. I'm not at liberty to discuss what legal advice you received in closed sessions before you voted to have that investigation by multiple lawyers. It'll have to come out someday, perhaps, if you have the same vigor to make sure that you're candid and transparent about everything as you were with this report. Lance started off by saying it's time to put the dark chapter behind us and move forward. I agree. You, you know, you haven't heard a word from me since I think March or so about this. I mean, this this all came about because we voted to have this investigation and you all berated me repeatedly back in November, December, January, February. But again, I defy you to identify what's been going on in the last eight months. Other than I've been working very hard on the homelessness issue, been working hard with, with a number of you on other matters. I don't know. I don't see where the dysfunction is. You, sh you show it to me what I've been doing for the past six or seven months um, that is now new. We got a report now. I have a lot of other notes here. Um, again, you know, I, I guess Barry Haldeman said, how stupid do you think we are? You need to teach us to trust you. <laughs> Get Barry, you didn't trust me when I ran. You didn't vote for me. You opposed my election. You came here and screamed about me repeatedly for a number of months. Now you're back. OK. Bring me the 20, you know, go get the 2,400 people that voted for me and have them say what you're all saying. I have no doubt a few of them are of that view now. I have no doubt that a number of people that didn't vote for me are of a different view now. But, you know, we're just, you want to relitigate the election? Give me a break. Elections, someone said, oh, it was um, Drew, I believe, about consequences. Well, elections have consequences. The, elect the, the people of the city spoke. I'm now here. I'm trying to do my job. And you just all want to continue to fight and pick? Fine. I have a lot of other notes about the residents. And, and I want to thank the people who spoke in my spoke on, on my behalf. Again, you know, it's, it's just the election all over again. The people that voted for me came and spoke on my behalf. The people that voted against me came and spoke against me. OK, big surprise. We want to replicate what's going on nationally. I heard you don't want to replicate what's going on nationally, but that's exactly what's happening. Mikey, I'm surprised with you. I thought we were getting along. I thought we were getting things done together. I know we've done a number of things behind the scenes that have come before the council for approval and they, they've, gone, they've gone well. We've made compromises, but apparently nothing's changed. That's fine, I now know. I didn't, and, and you know, it, it's, it's good that we all have immunity. It, complete immunity from slander for things we say here, because to say that I came to Malibu to escape federal charges, go find the federal charges, go find the evidence of them, show it to me. In fact, I've, I've been here for a decade. I know what you're talking about in terms of the matter in which I was involved 
That occurred seven years after I moved here. Okay, so I didn't come here to flee anything. And there were no federal charges. That's that's Mark Bowdy's fiction. I'm surprised we didn't hear from him tonight. I really, I really expected him to come and be the head cheerleader. Didn't cost millions of dollars either. Okay, so Karen, I appreciate the comments about my intelligence. Um, I'll leave it at that. Oh, 10,000 documents. Also, another thing, I've heard there were 10,000 documents. Okay, we've all heard a lot of things. I, I talked, I've, I've, I've talked to lawyers who were investigating that aspect of it, about it. it it's just, a, it's just another fabrication. It's another falsehood. So in any event, I agree it's time to move on. If you guys want to hold grudges and be vindictive, I can't stop you because, well, I haven't heard from Paul yet, but, but so far I've heard from two of the three who in the past were of that view. That's fine. And, and I guess I'll wait and hear from Paul. But if you want to, if you want to hold grudges and you want to be vindictive and you want to um, do any of the things that the 11 or 12 haters came and spoke about tonight, it's your prerogative. I can't stop you. Um, I said, maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have spoken about these things tonight, but um, I felt the record needs to be set straight. But again, I defy you all. Go, back, go, go find a single time before or after the election that I stated that I believed that the city manager had committed a crime or was corrupt. Find a single instance in which I said that. I dare you to find it. In fact, I think you owe it to the public to find it since you've said it all repeatedly. And you've endorsed the people who've said it repeatedly. So go ahead and find it and show it to the public because it isn't so. So, um, Paul, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Steve, you have the floor. Okay. Let me just change the tone for a few moments and, uh, and I may go back and do some other stuff later on, but, uh, we're approaching Christmas here in Malibu. And a lot of families are wondering what they can do with their children and their husbands while they're home uh, to sort of generate some of that Christmas spirit. You know, when I grew up, we had Santa Claus came to town with his reindeer and, you know, I don't know if they were really reindeer, but somebody said they were. So one of the things I want to suggest to you folks is go to the Adamson house and take advantage of the Christmas celebrations they're having down there. They're running tours. The tours are helping them raise money to improve the, the building. Uh, it's easy to get in. It's well worthwhile. They got Christmas trees there. There's a very happy spirit. So if you've got some time this over this holiday, go to, go to the Adams house, enjoy the, the tour and help them out uh, with some of their fundraising. And while you're there, stop in at the visitor center, because if you're looking for Christmas gifts, Suzanne Goldman finished chapter two of her Malibu book, and they are for sale at that visitor center. Uh, Suzanne was on NPR today, I think, uh, talking about the, the writing she's done. So if you, like I said, if you're looking for a Christmas gift and you want to help the city out, you want to help us with a, a structure that really is an important component of our city, go visit the Addison House, talk to the people down there, visit the visitor center, and enjoy the Christmas holidays. Um, Jim Braden, uh, after I listened to your uh, presentation to the Public Safety Commission a couple of weeks ago, where you mentioned the uh, the danger of not having cell phone service with these blackouts. So subsequent to that, I spoke to Susan Duenas, and, and she and I talked about potentially holding a meeting with the telecoms and with the in Southern California Edison to see if there's not something we can do to sort of rectify that situation. So we haven't got that meeting set up yet. At least I, Susan hasn't told me if she has, but I want to continue to push to do that. And hopefully we'll be able to come up with some solution that, that allows us to deal with emergencies during one of these power shutoffs, because I don't think these power shutoffs are going away anywhere in our near future. Uh, I've got a meeting tomorrow, a telephone call tomorrow with Tess Chernovsky, I think that's her last name, from Susan Duenas' office. And what we're going to talk about a little bit is funding from the supervisor. Uh, is there funding there? 
is why are we not getting any of it? Uh, you know, some of these, this, the machete attacks took place not only in Malibu, but also in the county. So I'm just trying to open the door. I want to get a little smarter on this issue. So hopefully maybe after we come back in January, I'll be able to provide some information to let you guys know what's going on. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, I don't know where the harassment study is out of the Bruce. I've got a lot of calls from people asking me to find out where that, that is. I, I don't know how we do that, but somebody should take a look at that one. Uh, and I just want to spend a couple of minutes on the comments that took place tonight. You know, I'm surprised. All of us voted to hire the law firm to do the, the study of the affidavit. And now half of us are sitting back saying, uh, not me. I, I, I knew anything about that. Uh, we all did. And I'll tell you the, the, Mikey, you got messages. I got tons of messages, email messages, as a result of that report. And I want to go back and agree with Howard Rutsky. Everybody should read that report. You should not only read it, you should ask yourself some questions. Because you're going to find things that report that are questionable. And I'll give you one to start you off with, and you guys can figure the rest of them as you go through. Take a look at Richard Mollica's interview and go to page six where Richard identifies the fact that one of the inspectors got fired in Malibu. And he got fired because he was signing permits that didn't match up with the construction that was taking place. Now, I mean, typically you would expect that somebody's doing that and jeopardizing their job. They're doing that for some reason. They're getting some benefit out of making that happen. But when you look at the interview, nobody asked a follow-up question. Nobody said, how come this guy was doing this? No one said, let's interview this guy and find out why the heck he was doing it. I mean, so this, the issue that says there were holes in this report, I, I tend to agree with, okay? And I think if you look at this report with a critical eye, okay, and ask yourself some questions, why did this happen and how come it wasn't followed up or what was, was it followed up? Uh, you may come away with a little different perspective than what we everybody talked about earlier this evening. And I think for me, the most disappointing part of this report, I have, you know, I've been, Mikey, you and I were on the planning commission for four years. I thought we worked reasonably well together. We didn't agree on everything. Okay. But I don't ever remember us calling each other names. Okay. And, you know, look, I, I'm a big boy. I've been called names before, so I'm not going to, you know, lose any sleep over it. But this process that says, you know, we want to, I'm back to this conversation we had in January when Bruce was trying to, you know, was going to be mayor pro tem. We've got to learn how to, you can't attack each other. That's what they're doing in the national level, right? People are calling each other names, they're jihadists or whatever the hell they are, and it's not making anything better. And that's what happened in this report. Mikey, you called me a conspiracy theorist, a booanon. What the hell does that mean? To give me the conspiracy theories I've presented to you and try to jam down your throat. I don't think I've done that. Karen went out and attacked Ozzy Silma. The guy's been dead and buried for six years. Six years. All right. And we're calling him a conspiracy theorist. So all I'm saying is, look, the words are nice. We got to work together. We got to learn how to do this. But you hit, the words have to be backed up by actions. And I'll tell you what, when I read that report, your words were not backed up by actions. You took a different approach that, that I believe made things worse. And I was sorry to see that happen. Paul, back to you. Okay. Uh, well, on a good note, in the past couple of weeks, uh, I was pleased to be involved in the presentation of Certificate of Occupancy Permits number 61 and 62. And I think that is uh, dramatic. It's wonderful. I wish it was at the uh, presentation of Certificate of Occupancies number 161 and 162. But we, we, have, uh, we have people making progress. And once again, anything we can do to increase the number of inspectors we have and, and the number of planners we have at least for the next couple of years is essential. Uh, we've got to get the people who want to come back to come back. Uh, and since we're uh, now talking about the other things, let's talk about it. Uh, 
We did hire lawyers, and I can tell you why we hired lawyers for this investigation. We hired lawyers for this investigation because it was taken to the district attorney and it was taken to the to the FBI, and they both blew it off. And what was our option at that point? Our our only option was to go ahead and have an investigation and try to figure out what's true, what's false, and move it along. Uh, Bruce, uh, I don't think you treated Jefferson as a friend. If a friend comes to me with something that doesn't uh, seem reasonable, I think it's my responsibility to talk him out of it. And the the uh, I'm surprised that anybody took anything seriously in that in that affidavit, because as I told people, there was with the buildup before I read it, I, I was expecting a hearty stew. And what I got was bouillon with, made with one half a cube of bouillon. It was, there was nothing there. It was immediately apparent that there was nothing there. And for now, we have people standing up and saying, well, you didn't ask me. And if, if those people actually had something that was concrete, and didn't come forward with it or make themselves known, I don't know what we're supposed to do. I, I don't see that there was anything there. I'm very disappointed that we went off on this path. I'm very disappointed that, you know, your attacks on Reva have re resulted in her leaving. And for you to tell everybody to look and see where they can find your, your quotes, Everybody knows that you, you just scrubbed your public uh, comment accounts. There's, there's months and months and months of comments that are no longer there. Uh, okay. So I'm going to talk to the public of Malibu for a while. Just a minute here. You, Malibu, you're in Malibu. People think in your, in your jobs, people think you're smart. People think that you're brilliant. And it's very tempting to just go along when people say stuff to you and not challenge them and ask, what, what are you basing that on? And if somebody says, well, I can't tell you, but it's really bad, here's a clue for you. You wouldn't invest money on that basis because you know that you're dealing with a con man. There is, if somebody won't give you cite actual things that have occurred and be able to prove it, it's all bullshit. And, and that is not appropriate. And, you know, it's, it's ridiculous that we have as many people who think that something happened and never bothered to figure out that, that maybe I should have asked questions. And anytime somebody tells you something and tries to make themselves important by telling you that, oh, I know, but I can't tell you, they're lying. So that's, those are my comments. Would anyone like to take a bathroom break before we resume with the item 6A? Or no, we have to do the consent calendar. Have any items been pulled from the consent calendar by the public? Just one moment, Mayor. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, item 3B4 has been pulled, and then I think the city manager wanted to jump in as well. I'm sorry, Steve? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I'd ask that we uh, pull item 3B6, that is the CHP agreement. Uh, the agreement was missing uh, part of the exhibit uh, on the attachment. Uh, we would ask that we uh, continue that to the January 10th meeting so that we can bring back a complete uh, report for the record. Thank you. Continue to January 10th. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Does anybody want to pull one of the other ones? Bruce? 3B11, please. 3B11? Anybody else? Can I get a motion to approve items 3B2, 3B3, 3B5, 3B7, 3B8, 3B9, 3B10, 
trying to remember. And three, continuing three B six. Did I leave out? Oh, I'm sorry. And continue yes. it. And continue three B six. I will make approve, that motion. Is that also approved three B one also? Uh, I don't see a three B one. It never has a staff report, but it allows the wave of the full reading of ordinances. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, could I just move to approve consent uh, with the exception of 3B4 and 3B11 and uh, continuing 3B6? I'll second that motion. Any discussion? Can you take the roll, please, for us, Kelsey? Uh, yes. Council Member Fair? Excuse me, yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. I don't get a vote anymore? Yes. You are the second one there. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, so that takes us to item 3B4. Uh, and do we have a public comment from the person who pulled it? Yes, we have Norm Haney for this item. Hi, Norm, are you available? There we go. Yes, I am available. <clears throat> I, um, I think that it's appropriate at this point to resume in-person city council meetings and planning commission meetings in the city council chambers. Um, pretty much everyone uh, that would attend these meetings have been uh, vaccinated and had their boosters and the city council and the planning commissioners, they can be separated by a clear plexiglass slider between them and I believe that uh, the people that are not vaccinated and they want to zoom in, we have the ability to do that. I just feel that we need to try and bring the city uh, back to a level of normalcy, uh, normalcy uh, even though um, we're still leading with the pandemic. I believe that it's safe. Clearly people can sit six feet apart if they want to. They can all wear masks. We can have two microphones. When one speaking through one, uh, on one, the other one can be clean and vice versa. So I, I believe that hearings go faster. Uh, questions are asked and responded to more quickly uh, in a in-person meeting. And I'd like to see that resume. Uh, those are my comments tonight. Thank you for listening. Good night. Thank you, Norm. Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks. Norm, thank you for the comment. I meant to comment on your saying that the last meeting too. I, I hope that we will be able to go back to in-person meetings in the not too distant future. Um, I think given that we've got another variant, although who knows if that really is gonna be a big deal because it, it looks like it was overhyped. Um, but Delta is still fairly rampant. But, you know, mixed information, we're getting better information and sometimes worse information every week. I'm hopeful that when we come back next year, we can reassess this and maybe start coming back live. But, you know, it obvious, I, we're obviously not going to do it for the next meeting because we don't have better information today to make that decision. But I, I share your, your view, Norm. I, I'd like to see us get back to being face to face, maybe maybe we'll get along a little better if we're in the same room. Who knows? Maybe somebody will throw eggs at me. I I, I have no idea, but the puxy glass would be nice. So um, in any event, thanks for the comments, Storm. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, I'd like to speak for just a moment. Uh, person personally, I got vaccinated as soon as I could get vaccinated. I've I've had the booster. My wife's had everything. I'm part of the age group that should be very concerned about this. And I've come to the conclusion that what I'm, all I'm really trying to do is put off the event of me getting the breakthrough uh, infection. 
And the breakthrough infection is going to happen someday as we look at it's probably we're all at risk of that. And uh, the only hope is that the recent studies that are saying that the breakthrough, that the, uh, that the natural infection that results from being infectious, infected is more resistant to being infected and lasts longer that the, than the vaccinations do. And I'm going to continue taking vaccinations every time I'm eligible for another one. But I think that at some point, Norm's right. We've, we've got to come to grips with the fact that this is not going to disappear uh, with no trace. And we've got to start living life again. And I have no desire, of course, to infect anyone or have anybody be infected. But there are other options available for them to be protected. And uh, Bruce, are you wanting yeah. to speak? Yeah, thanks. Just just one more quick comment. You know, most people who know me and maybe if you've just listened to me know that I, I've been as careful as anyone to avoid yeah. getting an infection and for, for my family as well. Um, you know, I heard a great interview of the um, head of UC San Francisco. Um, I forget the medical department. And he said something that really struck a chord with me, which I hadn't heard from anyone else. Maybe I just didn't hear them saying it, but said, you know, th this is going to be with us now, almost, if not indefinitely, for many years. And he, what he was saying was, and this is a 60-year-old man. He's, he's double vaccinated. He's got his booster. He said, I came to the realization that anything that I'm not going to do today out of concern for this virus, I'm not going to be doing pretty much for the rest of my life. So I've got to start making very hard decisions about how do I want to live my life. And that, that's why, despite the fact that I've been so cautious, that, that made a lot of sense to me. And I'm thinking, you know, we can't just keep having Zoom meetings and not seeing each other face to face forever. And in fact, we're getting together on Thursday for a special meeting where we're going to be in a room together. So, you know, time to rip off the Band-Aid sometime in the not too far future and start living our lives a little bit better. I mean, still cautious, but a little bit more personal. Thank you, Bruce. Be sure and bring your mask when we do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call the question. Uh, is there a motion to take the recommended action on okay. item 3B4? Also, yes. We have a motion to make the, take the recommended action on 3B4, and I will second it. Uh, Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to item 3B11, which was pulled by the city manager. No, it was by me. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Okay. I, so just very, very brief. Well, I, there's no public speakers, right? There's nobody else pulled it? I'm sorry. Correct. There are no okay. public speakers for this okay. item. So th this is this is the question of whether the city of Malibu should opt into an op one of many opioid settlements that that have been going on. There, you know, there's going to be more, um, or or not take any action, which would be the which would be not to opt into it and and not be part of the settlement. Um, we get nothing for opting in. Um, it, as I read the documents, they explain that we the city of Malibu may be entitled to as much as two thousand dollars a year for the next 18 years if i remember the numbers correctly uh, maybe less uh, and if we get the money we've got substantial reporting obligations which probably will cost us as much as the money so it's not being recommended that we take that option what's being recommended is that we take the option of opting in and letting the county have our up to two thousand dollars a year for 18 years which is kind of meaningless to the county it's totally meaningless to us and there's who know what the possibility is if we don't opt in. So I just, I, it, to me, I'd like to understand what is this worth to us to do? You know, is it that important for us to contribute $2,000 a year to the county and give up whatever rights we might have? Um, maybe it is, but, but I just thought it was worthy of some, some thought rather than just do it without thinking about it. Uh, I'm willing to respond to that, but if somebody else wants to speak first, I'll, I'll step aside. I, I believe that the county of Los Angeles it has a much bigger uh, 
pool that makes it worthwhile them processing it. I know that there are a lot of expenses as a result of opioid uh, damage and affliction. And the, uh, we should just be grateful that most of it is not occurring within our community. Although we have had people die of overdoses fairly recently and at other times in the past. And I think that the, uh, I can't imagine anything useful that we could do with the $2,000 per year, $2,060 a year that wouldn't, especially after we filed the necessary reports. I'd like to see some good come out of the money for, for something in our local area. And that's why I would vote for us to turn it over to the county and thank them for taking on whatever they will take on. Karen, I see your hand. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, I notice here staff contact is interim city attorney, John Cotty, who I see is not here this evening. And I was just wondering if Trevor would like to make a comment on it. Sure, I, I can speak on it. So I just echo what the mayor said there is that this program would allow these funds then to be allocated by the, the county who's you know, advised that they are putting together programs you know, to, to allocate the funds. The city can make a different you know, choice in the future if it ever creates its own program um, internally that it wants to do. Um, but it seems like that would be the, if, if enough of these are consolidated together, some form of program that can help um, would provide a benefit to the city, even if it is secondhand, um, there would be some benefit to us to have these programs put out there. And that's why it's been brought forward to you. Um, and if you don't, there's, it, there's you know, it, um, you know, the deadline is coming up, so you need to make a decision about it today. But um, this will be the, the opportunity to join in on these uh, settlements here. Thank you, Trevor. Bruce, I see you've got your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. It's just to be clear, because the, the comments that are being made are, they're actually not responsive to what I said. That doesn't mean we won't get to the same place, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm not advocating that we should opt in and take the money and have the reporting obligations. I'm just saying, don't opt in. I, you know, I get, I get class settlement notices all the time for send this in and you'll get 50 cents or send this in and you'll get a coupon. And I don't because it's, it's worthless to get the thing that they're saying. And who knows what I might get down the line if somebody else actually goes forward and doesn't settle. And that's what we're doing. We're being asked here to give up whatever rights we have in exchange for getting nothing. So, um, on the other hand, we're probably not going to get much anyway. It's, it's, I just, I just, my standard operating procedure when I get a notice that to opt in and get nothing is to not opt in and maybe get nothing in the future and maybe get something in the future. Well, my, my take on, well, my take on it is that the only reason to do this is to curry favor with the County of Los Angeles. And that's as blunt as I can be. So uh, do we have a motion to do one thing or another? Bruce, do you want to make a motion? Could I ask a question before we do that? If Bruce, I think we've all gotten those those settlement notices where you get a check for 17 cents or something like that. They really don't do anyone any good. Um, I guess my question is for Trevor. Um, do you have any opinion about about the likelihood of a better deal coming up? Uh, if, if the city is going to bring its own lawsuit, you know, that's something that we would have or we have some kind of particular damages that we're aware of, but we're not at this point in time. So it's, I'd say it's very unlikely that the city would bring its own lawsuit or be able to recover something uh, from this if it's if it does opt out and does not you know participate in this um that that's the reason that it's coming forward here is that this is an opportunity to do something yes it's it's you know not a a grand sum of money that's going to solve the opiate crisis but you know the idea is that every little bit helps and if it's put together with other little bits you know it can be something thank you trevor mikey i see your hand raised uh, just a quick question doesn't this case, if we're if we're not in, it's it's settled and we're on our own. It's not that someone else is going to come back around and and this this is a class action, right? Or I don't know if it's class is the right word in this one, mass action, class action. 
So we're either in with the group or we're all by ourselves going forward on this issue, correct? Going forward. Yeah, we're either joining in on the settlement here or we or we have or we reserve our own rights to do what we want. Okay. Thank you. Chris? Well, that's not 100% accurate. We're either in this with this settlement or we are still with everyone else who doesn't opt into this settlement and someone may still do something further down the line. It's not incumbent on us to do so. That's that's my reasoning. I, we're never going to bring a lawsuit. I, I, I completely agree with that. But someone might, and if there's enough someones who don't opt in, who knows, that might produce a larger settlement for the people that are left. That's not unheard of. And it doesn't cost us anything to take that risk because we're not getting anything. I think maybe we're at the point where we call the motion and see what happens here. Okay. Does somebody want to make a motion? Okay, I'll I make agree. a motion. I say I, I agree with you, Paul, you know, that contributing to the county since we don't have our own facilities anyhow maybe is the right way to go i'm not sure to be honest but it makes sense to me so i would i would uh a motion if our second year motion of staff recommendation all right Actually, I'll it was a recommendation it. it was an option yes so i i would say we 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 join so your motion is uh to this staff's recommendation and that was a, a second from the mayor is that correct Correct, and that's for recommended sure. actions Thank one you. and two. Yep. Thank you. That would be a motion. All right, one second. Kelsey, <laughs> will you take the roll? Uh, Councilmember Pearson. I'm going to be a yes on that. Thank you. Mayor Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Ewing. Yeah, if two thousand bucks curries me favor with the county, I'll give him the two thousand bucks. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Why not make it unanimous? Sure. Right. You know. Motion carried. Okay. It's 917 now. I'd like to have us go up away for 10 minutes and come back and hit item 6A. Unless you guys, you people are all much better equipped at waiting long periods of time than I am. I hope you'll join me. I'm going to turn off my camera and hit mute.
One to go. Hello, Steve. Okay. okay. It is now 9.27. I want to thank you all for being so prompt at getting back here. And if somebody wants to report me to the employment a group for making the breaks so short, I don't think we're meeting uh, OSHA rules. And I, I guess I will go willingly to my punishment. Uh, so that brings us to item 6A on the agenda. And I should be reading this because I'm going to make a mistake. This is under new business. This is the Westward Beach Improvements Project update, continued from November 30th. And we're going to have the staff report. And I think Rob DeBeau is here to present it to us. Yes, I am. Uh, um, good evening, Council. Tonight, I'll be, pro I'll be providing an update on Westward Beach um, Improvement Projects. And I'll be seeking Council's direction on what type of alternatives they like us to explore for this project. Um, let me give you a brief history on this project and, and let you know how this project was developed and then go into some current issues that, that we have kind of seen out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2016, the Public Works Commissioners um, brought to the staff's attention some issues over on, on Westward Beach. Um, they brought to our attention that uh, vehicles were parking on the sand. They were actually not parking in the right location on the shoulder and going into the travel lane. There were actually cars that would wait in the travel lane in, until a parking spot was open, causing some backup and, and confusion that way. Um, they also mentioned that the, um, the public often uses the road to, to walk down there and very unsafe to, to use the road, very congested area and, and in there. And so um, they also asked the Public Works Department to kind of come up with some alternatives or, or see how they could address this problem. And um, in 2018, um, staff brought an item to the Public Works Commission um, with some potential solutions. Some of these solutions included um, angled parking, a new walkway and some other improvements. And at the conclusion at, of the commission, the Public Works Commission all, all agreed on and they recommended 45 degree parking along Westward Beach. That would add approximately about 40 spots along there. Um, they also um, agreed to a 12 foot wide um, shared pedestrian and cycle uh, pathway that's adjacent to the 45 degree parking, um, and then also a concrete sand barrier, which will prevent sand from blowing onto the, into the new pathway, into the new uh, parking area, and onto Westward Beach. Um, in 2019, uh, staff brought another item to the Public Works Commission to add some more bike improvements, and, and these improvements were to connect the potential project to the bike lanes on PCH. So there were some other improvements on Westward Beach from PCH down to where the restrooms that are gonna add a little bit more bike, bike facilities for that area. Um, so let me go into a, a little bit of detail of the proposed improvements. Um, the proposed 45 degree parking, um, the pathway and the sand barrier will, will extend out from the existing pavement are approximately 30 feet. Um, staff did reach out to the Coastal Commission, knowing that this is gonna go into the beach area, the sandy area, kind of get their feedback from um, the Coastal Commission staff. Uh, Coastal Commission did recommend that we revise our local coastal plan. Um, that would allow um, development on, on a beachy sandy area. And, and in 2019, uh, the city council adopted a resolution um, allowing this type of development in, in this area. Um, a, a little bit about the funding on the project. Um, I, I was able to look into different types of funding for this project and this project, since it does have some active transportation elements into it, the bike paths on Westford Beach, 
the, the actual pathway uh, that, that goes adjacent to the proposed parking. Um, this project did qualify for Measure M, tra Active Transportation Funding, and we were able to get funding um, for this project using that. To, to date, we have spent about $150,000 on the design of this project. Um, so where are we now? And um, recently we've got some feedback and some issues and some um, concerns about beach erosion, particularly on the eastern part of the project. Um, there has been some um, significant erosion on the county parcel um, section where that, that roadway leads to, to their parking lot. That roadway got, got eroded, it, it failed. Um, and so those are the issues that are brought it up. Um, and so now uh, um, staff is really looking to what type of alternatives council wants us to look at and explore and, and see what they want to do with this project. And with that, I'll be available for questions. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we're, I think we're supposed to have uh, public comments first. That's why I'm not calling on you, Steve. Okay. Do we have any members of the public who've signed up to speak on this? Yes, you have five speakers signed up for this item. They are Suzanne Gildman, Craig Hill, Ryan, Joe Drummond, and John Mazza. We'll hear from Suzanne first. Thank you. Are you available, Suzanne? You know, I'm sorry, I don't actually see her in the meeting, so we'll try to circle back and hear from Craig Hill first. Okay. Craig, are you there? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, sorry, I have to go quick here, but some problems with it and a solution. As I e emailed you, LIP 10.5e expressly requires that applications for any development that encroaches on a public beach be redirected to the Coastal Commission. Not incidentally, 10.5c also requires a sign off by the State Lands Commission. Now, if the city were to try to still process an application, it would almost certainly be appealed to Coastal anyway, unless at minimum, it were to comply with the LIP 10.5a requirements for development on a beach, including, quote, analyses of beach erosion, wave runup, inundation, flood hazards. These reports shall analyze the effects of said development in re relation to the following. Then it lists 12 things. I'll mention just five here. The effects of a shoreline protection structure over the life of the project, the long-term effects on sand supply, the FEMA-based flood elevation and other map flood areas, future projections of sea level rise, project alternatives designed to avoid or minimize impacts. And then a CEQA initial study is also required as the site has mapped ESHA adjacent on both east and west sides, not to mention the MPA and the ASBS. So Coastal is gonna hear the application regardless, whether by original or appellate jurisdiction, bringing their emphasis on managed retreat. And where the road recently washed out, Public Works told us that's different in being a cliff, but actually it was also a sandy beach until recently. And there, the new riprap now functions as a shoreline protection device, so wave action and side scour will prevent future sand deposition and the beach won't return. Similarly, if this project were to include a six-foot sand wall, more than half of it underground, when it's reached by wave action, it too would become a seawall and the beach below would disappear. Now, this isn't hypothetical. Storm waves have already reached the restaurant and flooded the parallel parking on the north side of the road. Meanwhile, there's no study of traffic or parking to support this. Public Works has suggested you'd net 35 spaces while locals and Public Works commissioners count 21 to 29. But whatever the number, it's insignificant because there are several thousand existing spaces in the Western Zuma area. So available parking would increase by less than 1% while signing the death warrant for a quarter mile of public beach. So your most viable option would be to repair, quote unquote, repair the existing asphalt, some of which is currently under sand, making the road effectively five feet wider, thereby creating more space for bicycles and pedestrians, then install speed humps so everyone can share the road at a safe speed. Sweep the sand off once a month with your machine. Doing a mere repair wouldn't require all the studies nor the coastal review. And without the sand wall that turns into a seawall, you keep the existing sand deposition cycling at a natural rate. So this approach would get you 90% of the benefit at a fraction of the cost. Then you could use the Measure M funds where they're needed 
on PCH safety measures. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Our next have next? Yes, our next speaker is Ryan. Hey, Ryan, are you available? Yes. Um, I think that the project is, is not a good project as it exists, and that's reason enough for you to not go forward with it. The, um, the prior speaker actually brought up something I was going to say, and that is if you look at this from an aerial view or just from, you know, dozens of years of experience in Malibu, the problem is it's a narrow road. It needs to be widened. That's the way you increase safety. You don't put in bike lanes and this and that and everything else. You go, you, you go right for the problem. And the problem is there's too much happening and not enough real estate from one side of the road to the other. There's currently parking on both sides and you're going to have a hard time convincing coastal to eliminate the parking on the bluff side. Um, so therefore people are still going to have to walk across the street you know, barefoot or with their, you know, beach umbrella and their, their beach chair and their coolers and, and all that stuff, their radio, they're going to be going to the beach back and forth. So the report alluded that this was going to solve a lot of pedestrian uh, conflicts and it, that, that needs to be stricken from the report. And there's other things, if you're even going to go forward with this, that need to be corrected in your report. I would suggest you not approve or even file that report till it's corrected. I could give you language for that, but it, it will relate to future liability for this city if you don't. And the, the problem is car doors from both sides parking. You now have an issue where everybody's going to get their car sideswiped by all this stuff people are carrying to the beach by uh, uh, threading through and parking. And people are not going to wait and walk down the entire street until an opening exists to get to the beach or through your wall. Um, people with their hot feet, bare pavement, they go the path of least resistance. So I don't believe in the 45 degree. I think that was an error in judgment. I think it needs to go to independent traffic control. This was designed by Public Works and went to Public Works Commission. It's a transportation project. It should have been designed by outside traffic engineers. You should have held a public workshop, invited all the people who live at Zuma Bay Villas and in the area. It links discontinuous facilities to an existing bike path. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not a bike path. The LA County prohibits bicycles on their esplanade or beachfront walk. And yet you're proposing the exact opposite. No wonder they don't um, agree with your project and you're not including parking meters. Uh-oh, well, did I say that? Well, you can always negotiate it out, but it's not included. So there's no fairness or time limit imposed. Thank you. Fine, that's Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond. Hi, Joe. Are you there available? Hi, yes. You have the floor. I love Rob's idea in sending this back for redesign and further study that he mentioned at the last time this was up for the future of this project. Like Steve Uring and several residents have said, the Westwood Beach project of enacting seawall Paving, sidewalk, and parallel parking should require, at minimum, a 100-year sea rise study and a wave uprush study. Without these studies, there have been several errors found causing building too close to the mean high tide line, and now we must be extra careful about beach erosion in this already quickly narrowing beach. A resident uncovered issues with the project just upon lightly perusing the plan, so Public Works needs to do more study to make sure the project is feasible. And it had 97 comments on Nextdoor opposing the project, and I'm sure many emails to City Council regarding this. As new beach development, these studies must be completed in order to plan appropriately for an extremely small percentage of increased and dangerous diagonal parking in this limited space. Is it worth losing a beautiful stretch of beach forever? Please send this back to Public Works and planning to complete these studies and redesign accordingly to protect the beach there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Who else? Our, our next speaker is John Mazza. Hey, John, you have the floor. Okay, uh, I'm very reluctant to uh, comment on a project that comes before the Planning Commission 
So I want to comment in general. Craig is, Craig has explained some of the detail that deals with the Coastal Commission. But we were instructed when we reviewed this project, Craig and I at least were instructed, that we could make zero changes and our comments did not have to be answered and that it was an up or no vote. Now, I give public works and public safety credit for what they do, but as uh, Mikey and Steve both know, having been on the Planning Commission, you need to know what the codes are and what the coastal requirements are. And and I would doubt if anybody knows more than the Planning Commission. So to have the city attorney instruct us that, sorry, don't make any comments, don't make any changes, you're not allowed to do that, cost the city an appeal. It's still an appeal. And if it isn't done right, it will be appealed again, not by me, by a resident. Uh, it's very obvious what is violating the Coastal Act. But if nobody will listen, and we aren't allowed to change anything, and you have essentially, we have a new commissioner, so I'd say we have three and a half commissioners that are very well versed in coastal, you should at least allow them to give input and suggestions and changes if they see it causing an appeal or violating coastal or city codes. And the, the Planning Commission is required by law to review this, but it's not a review and you can't do anything. So I, I hope you consider that especially in future projects, because this one may or may not come back. But uh, it makes no sense to not take your uh, any comment from your supposed experts on problems with the project. Thank you. Thank you, John. And next, Mayor, we do have a raised hand from Scott Dietrich. So we'll hear from him and then see if we can circle back to Suzanne. Hi, Scott. Are you there? Oh, th thank you, Paul. Um, when this came before Public Works, the beach was in a very different situation. And when uh, this was brought to our attention, we had a meeting out there at the beach. And with myself and Brian Merrick from uh, Public Works and Rob and staff, couldn't have any more Public Works commissioners before we violated the Brown Act, but subsequent, we've talked to Chris Frost, and I I do recommend that it be turned back uh, to a joint meeting of public works and public safety to deal with the issues to eliminate a lot of problems. Um, I One other comment, Ryan was talking about people coming from the inland side of the road crossing the road that's really not the big traffic problem there's not that many spaces over there the the big pedestrian traffic interface is people walking along the road in the midst of traffic because there's no place else that's one of the issues that needs to be faced and uh rob Dubow, our public works director had come up with a solution that solves a lot of problems we get rid of the uh, any cement wall, we get rid of a cement walkway, and we put in a, a little wooden walkway that uh, sand can pass under. It, we no longer have the big sweeper issues, but there's, there's a lot of suggestions that have been generated um, in the last couple months. So yeah, it'd be better to send this back and then back to to planning commission for their input and then to council. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Do we have any other, any members, any other members of the public, Kelsey? We just admitted Suzanne, so she's getting her audio connected and we'll try to unmute her right now. Excellent. Hello. Hi, Suzanne. Hi there. Thanks. I'm sorry my uh, my server crashed, so I missed the earlier discussion. Uh, I 
this project, when it was proposed, we had a much smaller assessment of what sea level rise is going to be like in the future. That number has gone up in the intervening three years. Uh, it's probably unwise to build anything on the sand at this stretch of beach in addition to sea level rise. As you all know, we're dealing with sand loss. I think there's a lot the city can do to improve parking and safety uh, just with the right of way by repaving and restriping and reclaiming some extra parking, maybe putting a little parallel parking on the land side, but building things on the beach right now just does not seem like a great idea. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for making the effort to get in. And Mayor, I don't have any other sign-ups or see any raised hands from the public, so that concludes public comment. That means Steve Uring is on. Hi, Steve. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, Rob, let me, let me ask a couple of foundational questions, at least foundational for me, so I sort of get a perspective of what's going on. Uh, I've heard from you, I've heard from Scott Dietrich, I think I've heard from Brian Merrick, and that you guys don't think the project as it's currently designed should go forward, it should go back and get reviewed. Is that a correct statement? Well, I, I think at this point with all of the issues, the recent beach erosion, it, it's probably not a bad idea to retake a look at it and see what kind of things we could do to, to possibly kind of reduce any kind of issues with that beach erosion, especially towards the east end. I mean, I mean it, it's, um, it's yeah, it's kind of unusual that you've seen that. Uh, um, will it come back? Possibly, but then it, it will come back. It, it'll have more erosions next year too. So it'll continually have this cycle on here, and and, and so it, it may be a good idea to come back and let's let's talk about it. Let's have um, kind of a joint meeting with public works and public safety commission. Um, it's one of the things is that already kind of scheduled a joint meeting with them anyway to talk about measure R, measure M anyway. So this would fit pretty much right on in and, and we can get that done probably in January. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think it, we got to take a different look at this thing. Uh, I don't think the way it's currently designed is going to, is going to fly. Uh, yeah. I have a question. You know, when I was on the planning commission, anytime we had a project that was being done anywhere near the beach, we had to do wave uprush and sea rise studies. Uh, and if, if I, you know, just spend a few minutes going through Coastal Commission documents that are online, you know, they say that, you know, general situations where sea level rise should be considered uh, when the project or, or planning site is currently in or adjacent to identified floodplain, when it's currently being exposed to flooding or erosion from waves or, or tides, currently located protected by constructed dikes, levees, or close to a beach, estuary, lagoon, or wetland, and sort of this project meets like four or five of those criteria. Why wasn't a wave uprush and a sea rise level study done on this one? Uh, you know, uh, well, uh, uh, my department isn't the expert on what's required under the planning code. Then we would be called planners instead of engineers. And so I, I don't want to play a planner. Um, I'm, I'm a, I, I'm an engineer. Well, and, and we've taken taken comments from our planning, planning department and, and our coastal, what was required. And, and, and that's, you know, and, and that's what happened on this project in here. The planning, the planning I just wanted, just, it, just wanted to point out too, is, is that, we, you know, we also looked at the wave up rush study from the Sunset Restaurant and kind of where that is and how that plays into our Kind of development, I, you know, we did look at that and didn't see any significant impact from there. But you know, things have changed from that report to now, and so it, it's you know things have changed. Um, okay. You so know, you're, also, you're saying that you're saying the planning department told you you didn't have to do a wave up rush in a sea rise study? That wasn't that wasn't one of the requirements that we had to look at when we were when we put in a CDP for this. And that came from the planning department, really. That's, that's pretty interesting because uh, typically the planning department is the one that makes us go through and do the sea rise and wave up our studies. Okay. Uh, when this thing came in front of the city council back in 2017, uh, there was a meeting there in August, I believe, 
where the, you, you presented this case. And then right after you, uh, Franco from the Sunset Restaurant and, and Doug Burge got up and talked about trying to come up with a development plan that was going to be linked to the restaurant that somehow was tied to this project. Now, I understand that's dead. Is that a correct? Yeah. That's still alive? That's this, gone. Yeah, there was no connection between this one and the Sunset Restaurant. This was a standalone project that was... Yeah, uh, Laura Rosenthal was trying to tie it into a development agreement back then, but I, I didn't see a lot of... No acquiescence from the rest of the city council back in that time. Okay, so that's, that's gone. Last question, look, and I'll let it go and come back later on. This project is still sitting at Coastal, is that correct? It still has been pulled. Correct. What does it take to pull it? What, do you need direction from us? How does that, how does I, it go, how does that work? So, I, I mean, the person that appealed it would have to pull it from Coastal. No, he'd have to pull the appeal. He, he, that's what I mean, yeah. No, but the, you, yeah. we, we don't want to pull. Look, the guy who put the appeal in wants to appeal the project as it's currently designed. Right. What I want to do is get it to the point where we pull it from Coastal so his appeal can be gotten rid of. You want direction to withdraw the project. Yeah, right. withdraw. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying. So we eliminate the appeal. We Everybody's got a clean slate. You go back and do what you have to do. How do we do that? So you I, need to I, give direction. I, I, I think we could, we can pull the project redesign it and then go through the process over again okay uh, but because so if, <laughs> if, if we want to get the project appeal out of coastal the coast city council has to give co who the planning or public works direction if you get direction if you give direction today to withdraw the project then they would withdraw it okay cool yeah withdraw the project and, and then have just yeah um and then we can go back to planning to the public works and public safety commission and work something out um Paul, okay sorry about that. timing wise just timing wise also too what you got to consider too is that um this funding is set to expire next june not this coming june not uh so it'd be 2023 and and so i mean we do have time to get things done my plan now since it's here i, I don't want to go in construction during the summer uh, i would recommend going during during the fall, the fall anyway, that way we can be done and then have enough time. So I, I think we have enough time to do what you're talking about. Okay, uh, Paul, I've got additional comments, but let's go, let somebody else do some stuff and I'll come back later on. Thank you, Steve. Mikey, you're next. Thank you, Paul. And um, okay, I finally got to talk about this project. It's great. <laughs> um, and thanks for all your work on this, Rob. I know it's been a, a tidal wave of comment on this one. So uh, thanks for hanging in there. I think, and you and I have talked, you've probably talked to everybody here, but my worry on this project right now is just, is actually not the project, it's the viability of the road. And I don't know, one month, one year, 10 years. I, it just, I, I worry about what I see happening at Zuma beach overall. And um, it's sand comes and goes, but it's going more than it's coming. So it doesn't look to me like we're very far from one high tide and large wave event from the right direction to undermining that road. So that's my worry, which I've expressed to you before. And I don't have an answer, but I worry about the viability of the road because that road goes out. It creates all sorts of other issues unrelated to this project, public safety issues, public access issues. And so one of my questions is, we own the road and a little wider than the road, correct? Right. But the county owns the beach in front of it, correct? Um, there is part of, there, there's part of the sand that the city owns, and, and then beyond that, it's there's a, a section that's in the county. The question I have, and it's maybe just a, a bad question, and you can tell me that, I'm fine with it, is... Would the county or state take action to preserve what they consider their beach, no matter what we felt about the impact in saving or not saving the road? Does that make sense? Would they come in and try and do something on their land that has an impact on our land? You mean do some type of beach erosion or 
do some sort of, you know, like they put riprap, obviously, to the ro- the road going towards west, you know, down to the parking lot. Would they do that on their portion of the land without us having a choice? Is that possible? I don't think they're very forward thinking on this stuff, but do they have a plan? Are they trying to, do they have a plan to try and save that beach? I, I just bring it up because if so, we should know that because it would really factor into I, the future of that road. I, I mean, I, I don't know any plans that the um, beaches and harbor has for that area. Um, and, and I'd be, I'm, I'm kind of stepping into Richard's role. And, and if I, I think if they were doing some beach erosion or some, um, some rock revetment, then they would have to get permits through either the city or the coastal commission to do that. Well, they got emergency permits pretty quick when the road went out. So anyhow, I just thought I'd bring up other agencies who have a say-so in that beach as just something to consider. And I, I doubt there's plans, but I don't want to be, we shouldn't be caught off guard if that something along those lines could or does happen. I don't know if it could happen. Um, I think it's out there question, but I've seen stranger things. Um, give me a second here. And with the appeal we have, and you and I talked about this, we have some time. So I think going back to a joint meeting makes perfect sense uh, on that. So I, I support that as well. I don't know. I heard what Steve said on the mechanism of just pulling the project versus just sending it back during appeal to look at. I don't know which is the better way for staff to do it. Um, so maybe if you want to comment on whether pulling the project entirely or just sending it back for that meeting first makes more sense. Uh, okay. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. And I want to throw out a couple things. I don't, I don't, Craig was speaking pretty fast. So, but I agree that the thoughts of, less widening and a wood path without the concrete wall going down. And you and I have talked about this. I think it was a brilliant idea you had. I really do like that idea. I think it fits the look of Malibu better than concrete. And um, I think it would prevent scouring. Yes, we could lose the wood path, but your idea of a carpenteria type of walkway, I don't, I think that was a brilliant idea, whether anyone else thinks so. I think it's a good one worth considering. I think it would be a great look for Malibu. We currently don't really have anything like that um, in that area. And I also wonder, and I like the idea of speed humps on that road, makes a thousand percent. It's a great idea. I also wonder about the idea, and I'll just throw it out there, of seeing the possibility of a dune restoration project involved in front of that as well. Now, we know there's the one project that's been done, or I don't know if it's ongoing still. I'm a little lost in the dune project in that area. But maybe that's another thought for how we can help try and preserve that area a little bit more. I know we'd have to reach out to another a group to, to help us with that, but I just thought I'd raise that as something for maybe an idea at the joint meeting of the Public Safety and Public Works Commissions. And I think those are my thoughts and comments at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Karen? Well, Lisa's had her hand up for some time. I'd rather um, uh, give her the floor first. Very good. Lisa, you're up. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, um, and Rob is correct that there is time on the Metro funding agreement, that the money doesn't expire. But the funding agreement has a very specific scope of work, which outlines the existing project. So um, if the project is changed, we do have to go back to Metro and renegotiate that funding agreement. So and and because that was very tied to active transportation, depending on what the changes are, it may change what they're willing to do. So I just wanted to, everybody to be aware of that. Um, and as this moves forward, and I'm not saying don't do it, I'm just saying be aware that 
the funding is not completely assured when the project gets changed. So that was the only point I wanted to make just so that you had all the information. Thank you, Lisa. Sure. Karen? Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I don't want to repeat everything that, that's already been said. Um, I, I do also wonder about um, eliminating the wall and the cement walkway and doing the wooden walkway. Um, that, that seems like an idea worth pursuing. But before we all try to guess our way uh, through so many different aspects of this, I think it does make sense for it to go back to public safety and public works. I mean, I'll just say, for example, in my mind, um, since uh, emergency vehicle access is part of the nexus of this whole project, you know, Rob, I don't know if you have an opinion on, on uh, speed humps there, but it would seem to me that that's, that's a questionable idea there. You know, I did like the concept of the angled parking because it would prevent RVs from parking there. They're too long to fit into those spaces. Um, so there's just a lot of things to consider here. And obviously, uh, the mean high tideline. You know, that, that last big event, I think it was the first week of November, where we had the, the um, coincidence of uh, King High Tide with extremely big surf. Um, yeah, that took the road out. And I, I go down there frequently. I, I'm sure other members of the council do too. I take pictures, I take videos. Um, I, I wonder about it, but I see exactly what this report describes. People waiting for parking spaces, people blocking the road. There's no way to get by. And um, I, I have one question that hasn't come up for you, Rob. In your experience, widening the road, is, is do you see a possibility of widening this road to the point where it would encourage speeding? If it's done right, you know, if you widen the road to have more shoulder area or parking and to kind of do it to where you can, you, you can widen it without it being uh, speeding more. But, you know, if that's a concern, then speed humps and a wider road will actually address that issue. So um, okay. I, I, I'm not aware of speeding on Westward Beach and being a problem because that's what typically you would want to have speed humps. You want speed humps in where you have speeding problems like we had on Doom, like we had on, on Birdview and everything. And so that resolves that problem. I, I don't know if that solves, if that's a speeding problem on Westward Beach. I, I, my recollection, it's probably not a speeding issue. Yeah, I agree. It seems like it's the opposite because everybody's inching along, seeing if they can get a parking place. Um, I wish that Brian Merritt could have um, been in the meeting tonight. I got a fairly long and detailed email from him. I'm not sure if everybody on the council got it, but with photos of the road, the erosion, um, and he has a whole um, spreadsheet uh, with uh, two columns, the titles of the, the title of the first column, misinformation, misinformation spread on social media by opponents of the project. And then in the other column, facts of the project. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but let's just say a whole bunch about this project is in dispute. Um, I would rather have it go back to uh, public safety experts and engineers on the staff. Um, if, if it should be pulled from coastal, um, that might be an idea worth, uh, worth pursuing. Um, and, and, and get a fresh look at it. So that, that's what I have to say for the moment. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Bruce, you had your hand up and I put my hand up and then you, you swapped places with me somehow. Do you want to go? It's up to you, Paul. I, you know, I, I don't know how it, I jumped ahead of you is what I'm saying. So right, I'll, I'll be happy to go. I, I, there was, my computer's been glitching. So I'll be happy to go. Okay. 
Um, so first of all, th Rob, thanks for the work you've done on this and the presentation you made tonight. Um, you know, other people may not know it. Rob and I have been talking a lot and working together on various things. And by the way, last night at 5 p.m., I was driving to get some food on Canaan, you know, going up Canaan. Another, another car was in that gravel pit. Uh, so we need to do something about that. Um, anyway, th this project was approved prior to my election. I, I, I confess I didn't know anything about it until Andrew Ferguson brought it to my attention when it came before the Planning Commission. Um, so I'm looking at this with some fresh eyes. Um, I agree with all the points that everyone's made tonight. Um, Ryan, I think, made a great point. There's just not enough real estate to do everything we want to do. Uh, I mean, I, I like, I think we all like the idea of a safer road, possibly wider with speed humps. Um, we all like the idea of safer parking. We all like the idea of a bike path, if we can have one. We all like the idea of some kind of a walkway, whether it's um, cement like we have at Zuma with a wall, or I think even better, as has been described tonight, a wooden path, as Mickey and Karen have noted, they, they kind of like. Um, but we can't have everything we want because there's limited real estate. I mean, I, unless there's enough to get it all done, and I don't think there is, we just can't have it all. Um, I agree. I've read the appeal from, to Coastal by Mr. Browning. I, I think he raises valid points. I, I think there's a need for sequel review, but I always think that, or at least I, I've thought that on a lot of other projects and I get outvoted, but you know, that is what it is. I think, I think it's appropriate. Um, I, I want to read briefly from the um, written comment we got from Charlotte Fries on behalf of the Malibu Open Space Alliance. Um, she begins by quoting the vision statement and mission statement with emphasis on the following. I'm, I'm not going to quote the whole thing. She said, Malibu will provide passive, coastal dependent, and resource dependent visitor serving recreational opportunities. And then she highlights at proper times, places, and manners that remain subordinate to their natural, cultural, and rural setting, and which are consistent with the fragility of the natural resources of the area. It's important language. She then goes on and offers the following comments, which are not unlike what others have said tonight, but they're, they're slightly different. She says, the project is designed, destroys the beautiful, relaxed beach environment for which Malibu is known. How is replacing the view from the sunset with cars and barriers where before there were protective dunes a benefit to the residents of Malibu? I'm not sure that's a complete accurate statement, but that's what she says. Please send this plan back for further study. It seems that as designed, it will increase beach erosion, and destroy the friendly environment along Westward Beach. If traffic is an issue, limit access to Westward Beach Road. That would be great. I don't know if we can get past that with Coastal, but that would be great. Um, or insist that people park in the Zuma parking lot and walk to Westward Beach. That also would be great. Um, these parking lots are designed to accommodate the number of people that the beaches can handle. Perhaps it's time to rethink the whole area, including parking along PCH. Anyway, I'm not going to finish reading everything she said, but she concludes with, please abandon this project. I also would like to see us formally withdraw the project as it's currently conceived and direct public works and public safety to come back with a new proposal that properly addresses all these issues, including the obvious issue of sea level rise, which, you know, wasn't wasn't on the radar when this was initially proposed, possibly wasn't even when it was designed. I've got no interest in improving the area for visitors from outside of Malibu. My concern is the best interest of our residents. So with respect to that, you know, we need to make sure that people, the residents on Point Doom have access to an escape route if they need it. We need to um, avoid the residential neighborhoods becoming inundated with parking. Those are, you know, those are the kind of the keys for our residents. So we need to do something consistent with that. But it's not a resident priority to create more parking spaces or easier parking on the beach there. It's not a priority to um, make it easier to get to the parking lot. So I, I, I'd like to make a motion that we give direction to withdraw the project. Um, I think that would benefit everyone because we won't have to be working on defending an appeal at the same time as we're redesigning a project that's going to moot the appeal anyway. And as Craig pointed out, and, and I don't know what the answer to this is, but it seems like he makes a valid point. Section 10.5E of the LIP states I'm not going to read all the words, but that you need Coastal's permission in the first instance to do this. Not, not they have to decide whether to grant or deny an appeal, but it's their decision, their original jurisdiction, not ours. We're supposed to be proposing something to them, not proposing something to ourselves, approving it, and then waiting to see if somebody objects and goes to them. 
And there's also what the issue of whether we need a wave uprush study or an EIR. Um, so I'd like to see us withdraw this, let the appeal be mooted. It, we can then do it in an orderly fashion. I, I think I've heard we can get, if we have something else to do, we can get it done in time to not lose the funding. I, I hear a motion. Is there a second? That is my, mo my motion is to give direction to withdraw the project and let's go back to the drawing board, but with some alacrity so we don't lose the funding. And your motion, is there a second? Does that include uh, direction to return it to the Public Works and Public Safety Commission for further evaluation? Yes, I had said that before, but didn't articulate it in the motion. So, yes. Okay. Do we have a second? Bruce, are you... I'm I'd, Steve, like, you... I'd like to second that. Okay, we have a motion and a I'd second. Like, I'd like to offer a friendly amendment to Bruce's condition. I agree. Withdraw the project. When it goes back to whoever the planning or the public works and public safety, I, I'd like to make sure that they provide us with a wave uprush study, with a sea rise study, and a traffic study. Because I think you guys had a traffic study done that you mentioned in the planning commission meeting. We should look at all though all three of those should be a, a component of the, of the decision we make to make sure we're doing it correctly. Uh, so I, I'd like to have those three things, make sure that we get those when it goes in front of those other committees. Can I, can I ask one more, can I ask a couple more things? Yeah. I, is there anything else that you really, that the council really just mm, don't like it? it it's, or, or, you know, give us kind of more direction on kind of what part of the project you yeah, can we really do this well. by the Roberts rules for a second here? Bruce, <laughs> are you willing to accept Steve's modification? Because if you are, you're going to lose my vote. I, I know. I, I was I was about to say that I'm concerned about the modification as much as I want to accept it because okay. I think that it is going to interfere with getting an approval. So if Steve, no offense, let's let's see if we can get a vote from three people at least to send it back, to withdraw it from Coastal and send it back. And then we can see whether... You, we have three votes also to demand cert to require certain studies, but I don't think we're going to get that. So for now, I'd like to just turn down that friendly amendment and have a vote on where. All right, I'm going to second the, the motion. I'm going to second your original motion, and then I'm going to have do my comments that I didn't get to do before. Uh, for starters, I've been in Malibu for 43 years. I've never seen anybody speed on Westward Beach Road. The answer that they, it, it's nonsensical to worry about them speeding on Westward Beach Road. I don't think there's enough real estate to widen the road enough to need speed bumps on it, okay, for starters. And here's the shocker. Ryan, I agree with you about parking meters. Uh, although we will have to change the this area's second name, which is Free Zuma. And, they call it free Zuma because you're in between the Zuma parking lot and the one that's owned by beaches and harbors at the end of the street. So does it bother me that it, it won't be free? Not much. I, I think I, we are the only beach city between here and the Mexican border that doesn't have parking meters. And that is part of the reason why we are totally inundated with visitors all the time. And then people come out here they drive and drive and drive trying to find a free spot. And it's it's silly. And the other thing I want to go back to is a little bit of history on this. The whole reason we started talking about doing the diagonal parking was we have a situation where we were really concerned about trying to reduce some on the highway parking up by Matador where there were there was a couple of fatalities up there from people running across the street. And Coastal resisted strongly removing any of the parking on the, on the land side of the street. The idea, our idea was to try and put some parking where people would not be taking their lives in their hands in exchange for being able to get rid of some parking spaces on the highway, which had shown the potential to result in deaths. Uh, the other thing I'd like to, since you tossed the gravel pit into here, after we talked about the gravel pit last time, I've been up and down Canaan several times. There's four big billboards warning people, do not drive in this lane unless you're an emergency, you're, you're want to use the 
the emergency stopping thing. This is a runaway lane. There's white stripes on the road. I don't know what else we can do except maybe put up some some uh, some A-frame uh, plastic things for people to run into before they drive into the gravel. It's not the pe the reason that people drive into that is because people aren't very good drivers is what it comes down to. I don't know how somebody could drive along, read and see all those signs, which say don't park here, see the white stripes on the road. It's not an ex it's not a driving lane. You, you're supposed to only drive there if you need it. So that's my frustration with that. Uh, as far as a plan, an alternative plan for the beach, from beaches and harbors, nothing would make me happier if they were thinking about doing an artificial reef out there. And it would it be wonderful. And it, there is a, a big one that they're trying to put in. They're, they actually have all the components sitting on the beach down south. And I would love to see if that happens. And if if the county wants to do that or beaches and harbors is willing to do that, I think it would be a blessing for us to be able to see how it works, whether or not it retains sand, and and I'd love to see it. Uh, okay. Steve, you want you're next to discuss and then Mikey uh, then Karen. No, I'm I'm waiting for the vote. I there's I, Mikey. I, I, Mikey is discussing. Uh, <laughs> Okay, you, you unpacked a lot there. And by the way, coming down Canyon does get a little confusing. It's dark. That's a whole other subject. Not going there. Not on the agenda. Um, and I must be the only idiot who I've seen a number of people speed on that road and crash and actually go into the beach. So really? uh, that's another issue, too. That can wait till later. My only question on the vote, which I like the motion, is with Rob. Rob, do you think to kind of move forward that withdrawing, I asked this earlier, I just want to get your opinion, withdrawing the project's the way to go or just sending it back and not withdrawing it yet um, is the better way to go logistically for you and your department? I think either way. Okay. It, it's, it's, I mean, we're going to go back to public works, public safety, come back to council, let you know the alternatives and then get going on it. And, okay. Um, so that's going to be our process of kind of how we're going to move so forward. So withdrawing, it doesn't cause you distress at this point? I, it, it doesn't. It, okay. It, that, I, I mean, just wanted to ask that. That's, that's good to know. I think I would let Metro know that we are looking into rescoping it and trying to keep the same elements that made it eligible for, for Measure M and kind of see if that's still going to be put in place. If there's issues with the funding, then I'll bring that up to a council kind of an, as an update. That's great. And and lastly, uh, Mayor, I agree with you on the offshore reef. I don't think we should count on that. Uh, if you look at what's happening down at Broad Beach, uh, that's been an absolute no-go, and it's a mystery to me, too. So there you go. I'm done. Thank Sharon? you. Thanks, Paul. Okay, some of my questions just got answered. Um, I think what I really want to know is the restatement of the motion and how many of the conditions um, that Steve suggested have been taken off. My, one of my concerns is that there's not enough time to do all that um, and stay within the time frame that Rob is talking about, uh, about starting work in the fall. The motion, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is to uh, withdraw, to get direction to staff to withdraw the application before the Coastal Commission right now, and then to bring the project back for changes before the Planning Commission and Public Safety Commissions. So that, that's the sum total at this point of the motion. Okay, thank you. Actually, I think it was public works and public safety, but I could be that's correct. Yeah, yeah pu public works and public safety. Yep. Right. So yeah, I'm going to just, Paul, can I do I have the floor? Please, you have the floor. Yeah, so, um, you know, in response to Mikey's, should we should we work on it while it's still pending or should we withdraw it? I, I, I think I'm hearing from Rob, doesn't matter to him one way or the other. You know, if it's going to get changed, and I think it's pretty clear it's going to get changed, then it's not going forward under the CDP that was approved anyway. So, I mean, it, it, it's kind of just, there's no good reason to just leave it hanging. Plus, there's a chance we're going to have to deal with the appeal while it's left hanging. That's why I propose that we withdraw it. Um, in order for us to avoid being here again six months from now, um, at, 
and you know, if somebody thinks this is going to ruin the vote, say so. I mean, I, I think we ought to also direct that it come back to us for final approval once it's designed and ready to go. Otherwise, you know, it, it, I, I was going to say this before. You know, this is this is like you know, we're the owner of the property. The city owns this property. The city wants to do something with its property. If I own a house and I do, and I hire someone to design something for me, I don't then just say to them, "Go design it and go do it." I say, "Design this for me," and then when you do, let me see it, and I'll tell you if that's when I if you've done what I wanted, and I want to go forward with it. I think that should happen. I think if that had had happened. And this had come before the city council in September. We wouldn't be here two months later having this conversation because we would have said what we're going to say tonight, which is no, go back and do something different. Thank you, Bruce. I see Steve. Yeah, just Clary. Oh, Clary. Clary. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, council member. Uh, I, for the reasons that was stated, uh, I, I would also support uh, and recommend that if the council wants to send this back to go ahead and just withdraw the project. Uh, check this out with our planning staff. I think we all agree that that is the, the cleaner way to go. And by all means, if council wants to see this come back, we will bring it back to council. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Uring. Yeah, just, I mean, and I, you guys are going to vote how you want to vote, but is it worth our time since Richard's on the Zoom call, Richard Mal Malika, to have him give us his opinion of whether we're going to need a wave uprush and a uh, sea level rise study to get this thing past coastal because if we're going back and going to do the work and it's not going to, you know, it's not going to go anyplace, it seems to be a bit of a waste of time. So maybe if we could get Richard to give us his opinion, that might be helpful. Well, he just turned on his camera, so I think he's ready to speak to us. Council, uh, the, the real decision maker on that, uh, we look to our city's coastal engineers uh, for that. But what we could do is what I'm hearing tonight from the council is one, that it sounds like there's an appetite for what's called a state lands letter uh, to further uh, make the determination that this is within the city's jurisdiction and not taking place on state land. That That's what I'm hearing from one of the public comment, uh, member of public comment, and then also a council member. Uh, the Coastal Commission's well aware of this already. We actually worked with them on this. Uh, and they also certified an amendment to our local coastal program to allow for this development. Uh, but what I can do is definitely have a talk with our uh, coastal engineers to make sure that some form of analysis, um, whether that if this appeases the, what the council wants, it's, that analysis could do one of two things. It could either say that no, a wave uprush report isn't warranted or yes, one is warranted. How soon can you get us that? Rob, do you see any reason why? Well, once you have, I guess the question here is, <laughs> once you settle on whatever the design is going to be moving forward, that we can then have a talk with the city's engineers. Uh, am I missing anything there? Yeah, I, I think once we figure out the scope changes and everything um, from the Public Works and Public Safety Commission, bring it back to council, get get some consensus and get some clear direction on what do we want to do to modify the project and we modify the project and then we can kind of almost make a determination we could probably know when we come back to council what additional steps we're going to need for different options like for example if we you know keep this keep the sand wall or if we remove the sand wall I mean, it, are, are those items going to be needed um, wave up brush study or it, this, I mean, we can have all that stuff together when we come back to council to give it back an update and um, give those alternatives. Okay. All right. I'm All just right. confused. Yeah. Because I'm trying to figure out if I design the project and it comes back and then somebody says you need a wave uprush and a sea rise level study, you're going to have to go back and design it again, which seems to me to be a long way to get there. Uh, well, I, I think that just, yeah. So what I, I so my plan is, is Bring this to Public Works, Public Safety Commission in January. Get some consensus on what we're going to do. Come back to City Council and say, hey, here's the alternatives and here's what we're planning on doing. Get your guys' consensus, then go start the work and get stuff done. And, and um, 
move forward with a wave up, up rust study and whatnot from there. I, I hope I did that what, answer. That why don't you, you know, as opposed to working in a silo, why don't you le or, or link Rich and Malika into some of this stuff? Mm -hmm. so, oh, you're, you're, so you're doing the studies or you're, you're doing your planning. He may be able to get a head, heads up. I'm going to call a question right now. I'm not just hang on, Paul. I'm going to yeah. finish. You can call the question. All I'm suggesting yeah. is you should. Steve, I never you. recognized you. Oh, well, you should have. You uh, didn't raise your hand. I did, Paul. My suggestion is get Richard involved in the design. And maybe that'll help us figure out what we have to do before we get to the end. We have to do it all over again. Oh, absolutely. So I'll say we have a first and a absolutely. second. Would you take the roll? Bruce, is there a problem? There's no problem. I just wanted to ask you, and if you say no, that's fine. Mr. Browning, who is the appellant to Coastal, has had his hand up. I, I'd like to understand what he has to say, but if, if you don't want to, that's it's your call as the mayor. We're about to give him what he wants. Just, I just noticed he has his hand up, so that's... Well, he should have signed up to, I'm, to, I'm happy to comment vote. on this like we're, it says in the beginning of the meeting. You know, I, it's it's we've we've been trying to have a structured meeting and part of having a structured meeting is people sign up to speak in advance. And if you don't sign up to speak in advance, there's only three warnings I give beforehand. that says if you don't sign up to speak in advance, you may not be recognized. Now, I would like to have this this vote taken so that we can give Mr. Philippe what what he, Mr. Browning, what he wants. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Uh No, not unless there's a wave uprush and sea rise level study included in, this, in the project. Motion so, carries. All right, that takes us back to item 4A. And 4A is an amendment to chapter 17.41, Malibu Dark Sky of the Malibu Municipal Code to extend the compliance periods for development within the commercial, residential, and institutional voting districts. We have a staff report. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, what I have for you this evening, it'll be a quick overview of where we are. This item was first presented to the council at the end of September when the council initiated the, the modification to the compliance date. If I may have my next slide, please. As the council may recall, the compliance dates that are currently written in our code uh, are as follows. The gas stations were required to come into compliance on October 15th, 2019. The commercial areas were required to come into compliance October 15th of 2020, and residential institutional zoning was required to comply October 15th of this past year. Um, as the council may recall, the only applications to date that we have received have been the gas station applications, and we're currently working with um, Jim Benya, the consultant who helped us draft the Dark Skies Ordinance. He's currently assisting us in reviewing the gas station applications so that we can get those uh, resolved. However, the enforcement and outreach did not take place uh, for the other zoning districts in the city. As a result of this, uh, the staff came back to the council earlier this year, and we discussed uh, basically an amendment to section 17.41.100. If I may have my next slide, please. What the city council adopted in the resolution and directed staff to do was to proceed forward to the planning commission with an amendment to the ordinance, which would modify the compliance dates to for both commercial and residential and institutional zoning, all to be due October 15th, 2022. And then the additional items we discussed at that meeting too were that we would discuss code enforcement and also uh, the discussion of outreach 
later on this coming year as we work our way towards the mid-year budget. Next slide, please. As directed by the City Council, staff took this item to the Planning Commission for a recommendation. The Planning Commission made the following recommendations that you see below. They recommended that on the compliance deadlines, we require that outdoor lighting and commercial zoning districts be required to be brought into compliance by March 30th, 2022. Outdoor lighting in the institutional zoning districts, June 15th, 2022 and the date for residential zoning did remain the same. If I may have my next slide, please. The Planning Commission also directed or also recommended that a program educating the public about the implementation of the Dark Skies Ordinance be funded and implemented immediately. And also that the Dark Sky Ordinance be amended to be exempt from Council Policy 43. At this time, you know, staff has brought you an ordinance as, rec as directed by the City Council in the September 27th hearing. However, should the Council choose to make these changes, a new ordinance could be brought back. However, when it comes to the two changes you see before you here, these are items that the Council was going to take up at its mid-year. So these were items we had not yet discussed. And also in terms of the compliance dates, the concern that I have about those is that currently just getting the six gas stations into compliance is turning out to be a real task and even a, a bit of a head scratcher uh, for Mr. Benya himself uh, as he works to try to find a solution to make the gas station lights work. So I think in uh, staff's opinion on this, is that what we do, we agree that there needs to be a public outreach program. Uh, we also agree there needs to be some discussion about the enforcement of this ordinance. However, those are both uh, larger discussions, I think, that we need to bring back additional materials to. And then also we need to consider perhaps a budget of what the outreach will entail. If I may have the next slide, please. As, as I mentioned, uh, the ordinance you have before you is consistent with the original direction that was given to staff by the City Council and as memorialized in the recitals of the resolution from September 27th. However, in Section 4 of the attached ordinance in your agenda packet, there is a typographical error. Uh, as you see there, it's going to be right under Section 4. It says MMC Section 17.41 and then in parentheses B. That should be changed to read 17.41.100, parentheses B. Uh, at this time, staff proposes no other changes, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Do we have any public comment on this matter? Yes, you have three speakers sign up for this item. They are Bill Sampson, Scott uh, Greco, and Ryan. I don't see Bill Sampson in the meeting anymore, so we'll hear from Scott Greco first. Mr. Greco, are you available? Do you read me over? We do read you. All right. And 20 by 20. All right, five by five. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti and City Council members. On behalf of Malibu Community Alliance, we would ask that you implement staff's recommendations. We would ask that, also ask that you allocate resources to Yolanda Bundy for a definitive plan to be placed and to accomplish what is needed for the success of this ordinance. A fire rebuild should be compliant to receive COOs. There should be an educational outreach program for res residential and commercial properties, including local retailers that can answer consumer questions. Also resources to be allocated for compliance and enforcement staff. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your brevity. Who, who do we have next? Our next speaker is Ryan. Ryan, are you available? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I think what Scott said, you might wanna ask him to clarify um, there's two recommendations. The Planning Commission has implementation dates 
which were March and so forth. And maybe if, if uh, staff could put that up, what the planning commission recommended, it would be helpful. The, uh, the point is that you really can't have all these dates coming due next year all at once. It's just too overwhelming of a task. And it's not fair to the staff to do that either. Um, so I would recommend what the planning commission has proposed. I'm a little um, perplexed why institutional is moved to the longest date to comply um, on the list. Could, can you put the list up of the <clears throat> planning commission's recommendations again so I can refer to it? Um, as you drive Pacific Coast Highway at night, every time I drive it, it's getting worse, is the residents are the most um, likely to adopt new fixtures and new lighting, and it's the institutional and commercial that is recalcitrant and trying to run out the clock and so forth. So the, the funding for this program could <clears throat> come from compliance. And you won't get compliance if you don't have a date that comes into effect. So whether it's March or January 1st, or if you go with March, that's fine. Um, but it needs to occur, and the commercial won't get off the, you know, and do it until there's a, a deadline. The, the fire rebuilds are not affected by this. There was some misunderstanding in that, and I'd like uh, staff to speak up and confirm that in this meeting that any new construction or new projects going to have to comply with the dark skies provisions, which have been implemented for many years by the um, 800 lumen or 850 lumen maximum and the 3000 Kelvin, which is the deal breaker. That's what the residents don't know about is this color temperature thing. They're buying these daylight bulbs at Home Depot and screwing them in all their outdoor, you know, post lights and so forth. And, they're making investments. They're just choosing without knowledge and education. So I would suggest that the city create a mailer or a postcard, um, or as I would mentioned previously, take your option up of including an insert in utility bills that are mailed to the jurisdiction, which I understand you can do for free through the Public Utilities Commission with an advance request. And I would suggest you do that to the Edison bills and maybe the Ryan, water bills. that's your time. Thank you, Ryan. I still don't see Bill Sampson in the meeting and we don't have any raised hands from the public. So that concludes public comment. I think that takes us to the council. And I see Mikey's hand. I have to have a question. I'm hoping when you can answer. I lost part of what Scott Greco was saying as he was talking. Was he recommending... Um, What's in front of us here? Or someone could fill me in. It just blinked out on me for a little bit. He was recommend. What he said was he was recommending the staff recommendation. Okay. Okay. That but but if if Mr. Greco would like to raise his hand, uh, I'll allow him to tell me whether or not I misconstrued it. What he said. Okay, that's what I thought I heard, but you know, like Bruce's went out, mine went out too for a little bit there. Um, and I want to agree, I think it was Ryan that said it. I, I have lately just encountered a number of people who are very environmental that, much to my surprise, really don't understand the dark sky ordinance. They're they're confused. So we are going to need public outreach. We all know that. But I was caught off guard by a few people who really were quite confused on it um, and uh, don't really actually quite understand how it works or what it's about. So... Um, uh, that's it. That's, those are my comments for now. Thank you very much. Bruce, you're in the you're in the ready box there. OK, thanks. So, I mean, I'm going to start off and make a motion that we approve the staff's recommendation. Um, I'll second. Thank you. So I, I just want to say the following. When we uh, sent this to planning commissioners or races, I don't recall which, you know, it was it was kind of weird because we said this is what we want to do. But, but bureaucratically, we have to send it to them then to recommend to us what to do. We did. They're recommending something different than we told them we wanted to do. And now we're telling them, forget your recommendation. We're doing what we wanted to do. I don't know why we couldn't have just done this you know, a month ago. Maybe, you know, I don't know if that's something that can be fixed down the line because it seems like unnecessary red tape. 
Um, but we did also do one other thing. I looked at the, the action memoranda, and we directed staff to bring back an item discussing increased fines within the next three months. And that was two months and, four, and two weeks ago. And we're not having another meeting for another month, so we're going to be more than three months by the time we have our next meeting. I was a little – I thought we were going to get the, the fee schedule with this proposal as well, and I'm hoping we're going to get that with all alacrity. I know the staff's very busy, but that was part of the package. But notwithstanding that, I still think we should adopt this resolution. Uh, Steve and then Karen. Yeah, I'm not opposed to adopting a resolution. I do. I mean, it's a couple of things. On page two or four of the staff report, it says uh, the city staff recommends issuing a request for a proposal for public outreach. Why do we have to do that? I mean, that's a, a request for a proposal will take us two to three months to get done. And I think the city manager has got the ability to approve projects, what, up to 25 grand or whatever that number is. I mean, I don't know what you're planning on spending for public outreach, but we should be able to get somebody, get it going, because if we're waiting three months before we can get anything in place, meeting our, our deadline is going to be very difficult. So why are you suggesting a request for proposal, Richard? Um, my reason for that is that I'm, I believe that we're going to need to consider getting a consultant, like as we're doing with the gas stations, it's proving that someone is needed to help um, educate the, the applicants and also the staff needs somebody who can also peer review the engineered work that's given to us. Uh, my thoughts are that whoever we get, it could be comprehensive. They could help us with the outreach and they also could help uh, the city in the review capacity. However, if the council's direction uh, is that we, you know, do this uh, in chunks, we could definitely do it that way. But I do agree that we need to do some sort of outreach uh, because I'll tell you, my experience with the fire rebuilds has shown me that a lot of folks are not savvy to both uh, our fire resistant uh, landscaping ordinance and then also uh, dark skies. So when I tell folks no uplighting and no palm trees. It usually is not met well. Okay. So let, so let me, do we have, is there a plan in place today that says, here's how we're going to implement this? I mean, because that may tell you what kind, how much, how much of an RFP you need to get this done. Who's going to do that plan? Let me put it there. I'm, I'm pretty sure we don't have one today. Who's going to put that plan together that says, here's what our outreach is going to look like. Here's what our compliance or enforcement is going to look like. Who's going to do that? I think that's what we're requesting proposals for. Is so is we're not going to. So we're okay. So what you're saying is we're going to do an RFP, which may take us three months to get back, and that person is going to have to sit down and figure out what the plan should be to help us implement this thing. And we want to get this thing implemented by the end of October. That's, that's a pretty aggressive, and I think highly unachievable task. It's, we. At this point, what we're how we've started this process is we have started to work as part of our budget that's coming to the council, our mid year reporting. We are putting together a, a, a way to address fees and reviews so we could have a review and permitting mechanism put together. So that's something that the council will be seeing. And then, as I mentioned, and also as, as Councilmember Silverstein also brought up. We do need to return back to the council for some guidance on, on code enforcement and how we'll do that aspect of it. Uh, so that is something we, yes, we do need to return to the council on. And then we, like I said, the, we've worked on permitting. We're going to come back with code enforcement. And yes, the next thing is uh, outreach and getting in touch with someone because what we've learned from the gas stations is that there is some education that needs to be taking place, and it would. And one of the things that uh, Mr. Benio wanted to do is also just kind of educate the local uh, lighting consultants, folks that we work with, to also help with that. Well, I just I may jump ahead because I I met with Anna Walt Lumber today. Uh, the guy who's running that has done this dark sky stuff in other cities, so he's already going through the process of, of getting some examples of the sconches they could use to keep the light headed down downward and he'll have some people there that really understand what the, you know what the lumens and the 
temperature light should be so he can help people coming in there. But I, I just, here's what I'm trying to figure out. With all the stuff you just said, this is December. When will we have a plan in place that you think we can start going to the residents and the commercial properties and saying, here's what you got to do and here's when it's got to be done? I said, I mean, I'm just, I look, it's not going to happen in January. It's not going to happen in February. May not, it's not going to happen in March. So, you know, if we stretch it out too far, how are we going to hit our deadline of back? Other, other than the other approach says, look, everybody turn your lights off. Either put the, you know, do the compliance or turn your switch, hit the lights off. And if you don't do it, there's going to be a hell of a fine. You know, that's another way to get there. But I don't think that's what we want to do. Thank you, I just Steve. Want, I, well, I, like to, I would like to get an answer when we think we're going to have a plan in place to execute. Steve, that. perhaps we can arrive at that after we all this weigh in and discuss it. Okay, let's do that. Karen? Uh, I'd like to wait to hear what Trevor has to say. Trevor? Mr. Mayor, I was just going to say, I, I see uh, Commissioner Maza keep clapping, applauding over and over. I think he might have been doing it during the hearing. So he may be trying to raise his hand. I, I, I was hoping we could just check in and see if he was trying to raise his hand to comment during the public hearing portion. With your permission. Fine. John, are you applauding? Are you? Or... I thought I was raising my hand. I did apply to speak. I don't know why it didn't work. Um, I just want to explain real quickly why the Planning Commission did what it did. Originally, when this was approved, the, the city council realized that there's no possible way the planning department could handle all of the items at once. So they staggered it. Somewhere in the meantime, they skipped three years and came back and said, let's do it at one day. But the fact is, we don't have staff to do everything on October 15th. You have to phase into it. The other thing is, Jim Benya wrote the law for Laguna Beach. It's very similar for, similar to ours. It had a six-month compliance. Six months. It got complied with. They have on their website, and they send out to every membership, an already prepared brochure that has exactly the same lighting that we put on our staff report. Exactly. Because he wrote it. So that you could... You could send out tomorrow morning. Uh, Ryan's comment of giving it away free in the electric bills is fine, but that's on their website. They also realized that they didn't have nighttime compliance people. So they, they essentially put in their ordinance how the public could turn in scoff laws without using their name because they realized that they weren't going to turn in their neighbors unless they could without getting their, you know, dog poisoned or something. So this has all been done in Laguna. It's all been done by Jim Benya. It was done in six months. And I own a couple of gas stations. I do not operate them, but I do know that if you tell the supplier that the gas station is out of compliance with the city, uh, codes, they will turn off their gasoline the very next day. They will not deliver a truck. It's just very forceful. They want to comply with cities. So this stuff about having to engineer everything, when we wrote our ordinance, we put it right in the ordinance, what type of fixtures. We have a diagram. It's exactly the same one Laguna uses. The, the, and so uh, Jim Banyan wrote it. It's under the dark sky provisions. It's a dark sky ordinance. It went in effect in six months. So I, I think you should talk to somebody who's done this before, which is Jim Benya and the city of Laguna, and they will help you. Uh, but it's, but there is, Steve is correct. There is absolutely no way you're going to tell your staff on October 15th next year, get everybody in compliance. It's not going to happen. It can't. It has to be staggered. Thank you. Thank you. Karen? Thank you. Uh, well, okay, now that we've heard that, uh, could either Trevor or Richard uh, comment on uh, what Commissioner Maza just said? So we are working with the same consultant at this time, and I can tell you one of his 
con- topics he raised to us the other day, uh, he gave us two choices moving forward on the gas stations uh, because the problem is he explained the fixtures aren't there. And he said we could either recess the light further into the canopy or we could work with the the lighting manufacturers to develop a new fixture that would meet the requirements of Malibu. Uh, to me, that's a concern because I don't think anyone on the council wants to spend the time waiting for new fixtures to, to be made. Uh, so I directed our consultant that we need to look at you know the, the quick fix, which is putting the light further up into the canopy uh, to make it more direction directional. But uh, to my point about that is that it apparently it's not as simple as we thought it was going to be. And so I think that it's important that one, we do do an outreach and perhaps it, it could be with Jim. Um, I also think that one thing that we could commit to as a staff is that you know, once this new ordinance is in effect, uh, if it's adopted tonight, I definitely think that it would be worth the staff time to do a public noticing of it so that folks understand that the dates have changed and when they're expected, and that could be the, the ball that starts this rolling. Um, as far as a commitment of when we can start having the workshops, the Dark Skies workshops uh, and when the council uh, adopted the budget, uh, these workshops were going to be handled, if I'm not mistaken, through ESD. And it was, we were able to reallocate some of that money to be able to uh, fund Benya to help us in, in the planning department. So to get a date of when that's going to be started is something I really do need to work with our uh, building official on. And then the other part of this to keep in mind too, is that we only have about two thirds of our planning staff and about half the number of consultants. Uh, uh, folks, <laughs> the last week wasn't too good for us. So our last two weeks, so uh, long story short on that is, uh, like I said, we can commit to getting the notice out, which gets the ball started. We can, Yolanda and I can start looking at how uh, we could f- work on an outreach program. And I think also as part of that, we do need to have the discussion, uh, as Councilmember Silverstein brought up, about uh, code enforcement and uh, the fees associated with it. So we could put together a complete package and be ready to educate folks and explain to them, you know, at this point, we can definitely say you will be subject to fines, uh, but we could have all the details uh, for them once we uh, work with you as a council to help give us that guidance. Okay, um, great. Thank you. So, um the suggestion about uh, putting an insert into utility bills, I don't know if that would be Richard or uh, Steve McClary, Trevor, is, is that a, a feasible uh, addition to our outreach package? I think we'd have to reach out there to see uh, what the restrictions are on our ability to be able to put that into that. So that's something that the staff could bring back and bring another item forward. And that could be an option that can be explored. Okay, I, I think that's worth looking into. Um, and then also uh, it wasn't addressed uh, uh, by Richard, but um, Commissioner Maza did bring up uh, exempting council policy number 43. Um, and I just uh, want to state for the record, I do not agree with that whatsoever. If someone, as he suggested, is getting their dog poisoned over this, then that's a law enforcement issue. And I yield the floor. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, I see your hand. Thank you. Um, two quick questions for Richard. Uh, one real quick, uh, you know, people butcher my last name and Karen's last name and maybe some others all the time. You, you, you got my name right, which I appreciate. I've heard your last name pronounced various different ways also. What, what is the proper pronunciation of your last name? Could you please tell us? It, it really is uh, Molika, but we've just gotten used to it. <laughs> okay, well, great. okay, Molika. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the question I was, I mean, maybe I missed someone say this, explain this. Uh, do we have like the most stringent requirement of any city or is what we're what we've done here similar 
were, were maybe even identical to what others have done? I would need, I mean, that's a, I could find that out for you. I, I would like to ask Mr. Benya that question uh, because I, from what I've seen, I, light spill, some cities do that. And also some, in a lot of cities just say downward facing. We also have a, a, a requirement on what time lights turn off. And we also went as far as landscaping. So I, I could get you that answer. I, I would like to confirm with him. Okay. The, the reason I ask is, at least with respect to the gas stations, and I know they're not even part of what we're approving tonight, but it's like, you know, they're, they're big business. And if this is the same rule that applies to a, at least one gas station somewhere else, and they're complying, I just don't get it. You don't just get to refuse to comply with the law and complain it's hard. You, you do it. So, you know, if, if there's at least one gas station in this country that's complying with this rule, these gas stations need to comply or get fined. That's my view. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just say that I'm with Karen on uh, taking out the second recommendation from the Planning Commission. Uh, I think the first recommendation is excellent. I'm pleased to hear that our consultant has previously done a, an outreach to the City of Laguna, and I think that John's uh, Mr. Maza's recommendation that we go down there and grab all their information and stamp our name on it and send it out is a heck of a good idea to get the thing started. Uh, I am a very much aware of the fact that we have a lot of residential properties in this community and thinking that they're all going to come into compliance on the same day is probably not going to happen. There will be some people who do who will be early adopters and who will be ambassadors to their neighborhoods. And I think that generally speaking, nobody wants to be the jerk in the neighborhood. Uh, when we remodeled our house in Malibu West, it really wasn't hard to find downward facing lights, but I'm, I, there's a very good chance that my light bulbs may be the wrong Kelvin and I'm looking forward to uh, taking a better look at that so that I get the appropriate color lamp in those fixtures. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm pretty ready to, uh, to vote for the recommended action with the addition of uh, the program educating the public about the implementation of the dark sky ordinance. I don't know if that's our motion that we had earlier or not. It, well, the, the motion it has to be amended, approve, I think. Is, the motion was to approve the staff's recommendation. Is there, if there's an amendment to that, make it and I'll agree to it. The motion I would make would add on the portion that the Planning Commission said about a program educating the public about the implementation of the Dark Sky Ordinance be funded and implemented immediately. That's I'll a friendly say, amendment? That's, well, I'm as friendly as I can be. <laughs> I'm pretty cranky today. <laughs> That's accepted by uh, by the mayor pro tem. I will accept my friend's amendment. And who had the second? I had I had the second. I'll accept it as well. Okay. And I see Lisa Solinger has raised her her hand. So I'm just asking about this funding it immediately. We have not put on this agenda appropriating money to fund anything nor an amount um so nor have, i don't even think i have from richard what we think we're talking about um i can roll it can be rolled into the mid-year it could also come back at the next meeting i don't know you know i i hear you say immediately and okay i don't, uh, I don't necessarily have the tools to do that at this exact moment Thank you, Lisa. To be clear, for a little earlier, I was not even kidding a little bit when I said we ought to uh, call up Laguna and appropriate all their materials. Uh, I don't think we need to do a lot of design if we have a consultant working for us who designed those materials from another community 
and we've had testimony that the uh, the adoption went well. And and the bully, if if they won't if they will license that material to us, because we'd hate to be, you know, bad people and just appropriate it. I would like to see us use that and stamp our name on it wherever it says Laguna Beach. Can I make a Paul? Instead of Please saying do. immediately, instead of saying immediately, how about we say as soon as practicable, as as the motion. Thank you. I accept that change. I accept it as well. Good. All right. I think we have a motion and a second, and it seems like it's uh, acceptable to most people. So let's uh, call the question. Sure. And I need to read the, the ordinance for this one. So I wish you would. This would be the introduction of ordinance number 496, an ordinance of the city of Malibu adopting zoning text amendment number 21-003 amending a Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 17.41 Malibu Dark Sky to extend the compliance periods for development within the commercial, residential, and institutional zoning districts and finding the action exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Okay. All right. Are you ready for the roll call vote? We are ready for the roll call vote. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. That puts us at item 4B, an amendment to Title 17 of the Malibu Municipal Code to extend temporary parking in the city's chili cook-off site for the farmer's market. This is a second reading. Do we have a staff report? I don't know that we need one, but... Good evening, Mayor. Normally, second readings are on the consent calendar and not labeled as a hearing. The reason why this one's a hearing is not that there's anything changed or anything like that. It's still the, the same ordinance as was presented in your last meeting in November. But because of us doing our best to get this uh, effective as close to the first of the year as possible, we were not able to make and Trevor correct me if I'm wrong here on how I word this the we were not able to get the full noticing period in uh, because we were not able to get our notice sent out until we had the planning commission meeting on I want to say it was the first of November when they made their recommendations to council and so the the requirement is that the notice be completed the, that period be completed before the second reading and so that is why it's another hearing tonight, but I'll be glad to answer any questions, but there are no changes from what I presented last time. I can clarify the, the code requires 21 days before the public hearing on it. It doesn't require it before introduction of the ordinance. And so if we can't meet that, um, we have to have a, a public hearing when you introduce the ordinance. If it's not able to meet that, you can have a second public hearing on the item. Um, it just means that we have to have two hearings on it to make the notice. Thank you for the education. Okay, do we have any members of the public who wish to comment on this? Deborah Bianco did sign up to speak on this item, but I don't see her in the meeting and I don't see any raised hands from the public. So that concludes public comment. Any council comments? I'll make a motion to approve this. I'll second that motion. That's staff's recommendation, correct? Cor that is correct, thank you. Any discussion? Kelsey, will you be kind enough to take the roll, please? Council Member Pearson? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to, to 4C, which has been pulled and will uh, show up back on uh, January the 10th. That takes us to item 5A. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I have a very brief presentation for you tonight. I uh, just wanted to give you an update on where we're at right now with the local and state redistricting. Uh, again, just as a, uh, as a lead in here uh, to remind everybody that uh, this is a new process that we're undergoing. Uh, in the past, uh, the state legislature had been the deciding body uh, for when it came to 
uh, splitting up the, the various districts in the state. And the Board of Supervisors previously had been responsible for any redistricting uh, within their districts. Uh, with this, with the change this year that is now being done by, um, uh, for the state through the California Redistricting Commission and for the county, it's being done by the Citizens Redistricting Commission. Uh, they are moving along and getting towards the end. So we can go to the next slide, please. What you're looking at here is the uh, final proposed map uh, for the county supervisorial districts. And if you can go to the next slide, the blue there, you can see now pops up here and that shows the, uh, the proposed district that includes Malibu. You can see there in the bottom of your screen and it extends all the way uh, to the west to the Ventura County line, uh, to the east encompassing Santa Monica, up over to Beverly Hills. The border comes around, includes the San Fernando Valley and then it wraps around and includes um, uh, also the the, uh, the portions that include Calabasas and Westlake and Agoura Hills. Uh, back in uh, November, uh, the city had directed staff to send a, 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 um, a letter uh, expressing uh, its desire to keep the COG cities, uh, the Las Virgenes Malibu um, coalition of governments together. Uh, and that does, at least with this map, uh, we are still together there. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is giving a little information. Again, they're, they are wrapping up the process here uh, for the county. They have a special meeting for this Wednesday. Uh, and uh, you can tune in and watch that meeting. Uh, and meeting information is there. Go to the next slide. So we expect them to take final action on the recommendation at that point. Uh, these are the maps that are coming from the California Citizens Redistricting Committee. Uh, this is the map that shows the draft uh, congressional district. And you can see that the uh, this iteration places Malibu in a different con congressional district uh, as Westlake Village, Calabasas, and Agoura Hills. So we were not able to stick together with, uh, with all the COG cities in there. So that's the final proposed map for that. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this shows the draft for the assembly district and Malibu is in the same district as Westlake, Calabasas and Agoura Hills. But as you can see, uh, Hidden Hills is, is cut out of that. And next slide, please. And this is the draft Senate map. That's a, a little hard to read there, uh, but again, in the same district as Westlake Village, Calabasas and Agoura Hills. Go to the next slide, please. And this is the proposed draft map for the draft board of equalization. And I think you can go to the next slide as well. So this is the remaining schedule. Uh, so you can see they're, they're going to be 12-18 uh, doing the final review for the Senate Assembly and Board of Equalization maps, uh, and then looking to make a approval of final maps on December 20th. And uh, they have to complete their final report and deliver their maps to the Secretary of State by December 27th. The next slide, please. Be happy to take any questions or comments. At this point, Mikey and then myself. Uh, I just want to say I listened in on both last Wednesday and last Thursday's meetings. And last Wednesday was scary. It, it, the map that seemed to be gaining traction was a district, was, was a very odd district. It had it going all the way down the coast, which created all sorts of issues. It had West Hollywood out. It had the San Fernando Valley all messed up. It did have the cog together and everybody from LA County gave their input. You get one minute, which by the way, is very interesting when you're trained at one minute, boy, do people get to the point. Some of them really good speakers in one minute. We could learn from that. I could learn from that. Um, I was very, obvious, very noticeable how nimby everyone who spoke was. <laughs> everyone cared about their own, their own town. Nobody was thinking globally. So I was a little worried. Come Thursday, I don't know how they did it, but that Citizen Commission completely changed the map that is 
map F that was disturbing and really understood all the communities of, of that, that shared interest, um, the Asian communities, downtown LA, the San Fernando Valley was even pretty happy. It cut us off, us off around uh, Marina Del Rey area, which made way more sense for a lot of reasons. So pretty impressive. You know, some other of the, you know, assembly and stuff like that's a little different, but I was very impressed with their process and how many Malibu people actually spoke. Um, so I just wanted to share that. That's it. Thank you, Mikey. Uh, I'm a little confused as the maps we're looking at in the back, the last three maps. Kelsey has her hand up, which makes me think there's public speakers. I just wanted to jump in before you get too far to know that there are not any public speakers for this item and we don't have any raised hands from the public. Thank you, Kelsey. And I apologize once again for my haste. Uh, uh, can someone tell me there's three maps at the end and they are map B, F, and G? And I'm fond of V and G, but I don't have any idea which one of those last three maps is, it, is the... They're different now. They're different now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, what we... Yeah, it's a, it's a hybrid map now. If those were the three going in of which F seemed to be taking the lead. And but it didn't. F is now totally changed. I think it's the. I think it is the map they're recommending, but it's a different version. That's what Steve showed. That's correct. That's my understanding. And can that map be placed on the screen again, please? Sure. Can we pull it up? I think it was slide two. Do we know what that dividing line in Santa Monica is? So we can go to the next slide. It'll make it a little closer detail. There you go. I'm, uh, it's more like Culver City area. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's Culver City area-ish. And then up by Beverly Hills, it scoops in and gets West Hollywood and all that. And then the, I think it's District 2 is the one below it. And that now encompasses a bunch of Asian communities that really wanted to be together, which made sense. Okay. So we're still with Santa Monica. Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Karen, please. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, but on, on the county map, um, I'm satisfied with this. Uh, I, I, the one thing I want to do is I want to acknowledge um, Steve McClary for his uh, 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 advocacy on this, and most especially uh, Terry Dipple, who's the executive director of the Las Virginas Malibu COG. He's really been just such a solid advocate for the COG on this, very articulate and all of the COG city mayors, um, Dennis Weber from Agora wrote just such a great letter. Um, and, and I, I wasn't sure. I was nervous about this, like Mikey said. Um, and, and I, I feel like I can live with this. It's not perfect. Um, but I feel like it could have been so much worse. And, and I'm just, I'm relieved about that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, I will make a motion. Let me get the wording. I think um, we're just looking. It's a receive and file, I think. Yeah. Yes, please. Just receive and file. And again, thank you. Okay. Does anybody want to? Uh, let's. I guess what we need to do is thank Karen and Steve and Mikey for their efforts on this and uh, move on. Is that appropriate? Yes, if you can just say without, without objection, it's received and filed. Well, I don't see an objection, so very good. You just and need I'm, to say it, that's all. Oh, <laughs> without objection, we were glad to receive this. And file it.
and file. Sorry. Consider it done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to item 6B, if I haven't missed one along the way. And this is a, a motion, an item about uh, temporary use permits. And I imagine we're going to have a report from staff on this. Yes, good evening, Mayor. What I have before you this evening is a an opportunity for the council to direct staff to initiate an amendment as own text amendment to our municipal code to address uh, changes uh, to the temporary use permit ordinance that we have. If I may have the next slide, please. The current ordinance was effective, uh, was drafted and adopted and became effective in 1999. There have uh, not been any changes to it. And once again, I want to be clear that what we're proposing at this time, uh, you know, to look at uh, chapter 17.68 and just to update the regulations for temporary use events that are on non-residential properties. This would not apply to residential properties, which are regulated as part of chapter 5.3 of our municipal code for special events. Next slide, please. Some of the issues that we've identified recently and just also uh, for a number of years now in the department is that it would be good to have a, a definition for temporary an event, something that's specific to the commercial district, not residential. Look at requirements that would preclude back-to-back -back events with little to no time between uh, events taking place on a property. Uh, to perhaps have them space out uh, throughout the year, look for some sort of requirement to make it balanced so that it doesn't seem like a hot spot on a property. Consider guidelines to address events that do not occur on consecutive days, uh, but are within the 14 day allowance that a TUP can be issued for. If I may have the next slide, please. Consider a uh, consider the permitting uh, permit processing uh, guidelines in terms of the the noticing requirements, how much time is noticed, and then also when the decision has to be rendered on the event, how much time before. This is something that has been a number uh, an issue for a number of years. Uh, we are often faced with last minute events and. Uh, I can give examples of last minute events that happened this year and where uh, staff, you know, has a hard time with it. I've, I've been making it a point uh, since I've become the planning director to really hold a, a hard line on the required noticing. I've really tried to stick to that. However, sometimes it's hard because what we end up running into are events that are for the public's interest. And uh, they are things that, you know, there's a public good to them. They're, there's some sort of, uh, you know, uh, benefit there, and it's it, it's something that may not be able to be rescheduled. We've been fortunate uh, when I was working with one of the folks on the PTA, they were able to reschedule a, a like a gift wrapping event or a bake sale type thing in the lumber yard. They were able to accommodate our 32 day noticing. But what we're finding is that folks don't understand the complexities of the code. And then also when we do do these notices, in some cases, uh, we're finding that the notices, if the intent is that it provides some sort of uh, alert to the residents, um, that's not always happening because some of these events are taking place in our commercial areas and we end up just issuing a, a mailer to the residential properties in the immediate, uh, no, excuse me, a mailer to the commercial properties in the immediate area because the residential properties are in excess of 500 feet. Um, and, you know, the businesses, usually it's not a concern for them, but it is for residents. So we want to make sure that uh, residents are getting proper notification. There's also, we've discovered that there are um, conflicting appeal provisions uh, in chapter, uh, Title 17. And so we'd like to remedy those. And then also something else to look at is perhaps there could be different classes of 
uh, events that require temporary use permit and perhaps different mechanisms uh, for those. And so my example here would be if there is something small like an art walk in Legacy Park, uh, perhaps since that's a public event on a public park, it it be looked at differently than say a a movie release party in a commercial district where it's a private event, it's for profit, and it has a private guest list. It's not something that's open to the public. If I may have the next slide, please. So the next steps for this would be if the council wishes to initiate an amendment to revise the temporary use ordinance and then direct staff to schedule a zoo races meeting uh, where this could be further discussed and guidance can be given by the zoo races subcommittee and then with that guidance we could then uh, normally we'll, the process would be to go to the planning commission however if the council would like it to be different we bring it back to council for feedback we could do that whichever the the council wishes also on Friday, there was a supplemental staff report issued on this uh, to give a bit more clarity to some of the issues we've been faced with lately, for example, serial events. And as part of that staff report, what I uh, explained in there is that the staff did look at updating the TUP ordinance in 2010. And it did make it as far as Zoe races because a lot of the issues that we're faced with today are still issues, uh, you know, they're, they're issues we were faced with at that time. Like for example, uh, the public noticing requirement, that was something that was an issue and the, and the, uh, the permitting, wind, uh, the requirements for permitting. And then also uh, the issue of these serial events or, or non-consecutive events. And uh, for example, during the summer, there'll be a, a summer concert series where uh, there'll be some uh, commercial property that will want to do Friday night concerts. And, you know, six TUPs, if staff were to look at just the one night as a TUP on its own, uh, there wouldn't be enough TUPs on that property for all of the, the public events they do. So like for example, you'll have commercial properties that want to do summer movie nights and then come Christmas and holidays, they'll want to do like a Christmas wrapping paper event on Saturday afternoon, then Sunday afternoon, a caroling in the park kind of thing. So um, staff has been faced with this issue for a number of years. And in that supplemental event or su supplemental report, there was a table attached that showed the types of events that have required permitting uh, for multiple days under one temporary use permit. And it reflected both events, like I mentioned, like they were open to the public, such as these movie nights or Christmas wrapping paper or, or caroling type things, as well as things like the launch of the new electric BMW that was a private event and some movie screenings. If I may have my next slide, please. I'm available for any questions on this, if there are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I see uh, Mikey Pearson, followed by Bruce Silverstein. Well, public comments? You go to the public first. Public, I'm think. sorry, public comments. So I guess John, Ma, is John Mazza one of the public who we uh, signed up? We do have up? him on the list. We have three people on the list. They are Bill Sampson, Ryan, and John Mazza. Bill Sampson is no longer in the meeting, so we'll hear from Ryan first and then John. Very good. Ryan? Yes, I, I remember, I don't know if it, electric BMW is now a different one, but I think at, um, it looked like it was at Nobu from the pictures to me is when Porsche unleashed the Taycan, the electric uh, sports car. They did it there in Malibu and, and they videotaped it. You can see it on the internet and they got a police escort from the sheriff front, front and back because the vehicle wasn't really, wasn't legit. It wasn't, you know, uh, a factory car yet. Um, that type of a special event where you're, you're coddling the media to show up to showcase something. That needs a TUP. I don't know if we had one. Maybe we did. Richard could probably comment on that. But that's the type of activity for which there needs to be limits because as those things are disruptive, 
to the public, the traffic, the neighborhood, uh, and so forth. I would like to also hear maybe from uh, other people in, in uh, the city staff, maybe the, um, you know, maybe the assistant city manager, uh, maybe Steve McClary, the city uh, manager, about how do you look at this from um, afar and say, look, you, you're going to, you, there's a proposal here to try and, and put a multiplier in a TUP application and we have it, you know, every Saturday for three weeks or, you know, some, some extended thing. And that's a whole entire program. That's not a temporary use. You know, a temporary use is a day or two. Um, and th I think there needs to be a cumulative limit uh, within any 30 or 60 day period. There could be some very simple mathematical ways that the staff could implement to uh, avoid the abuse uh, and the example, I think, uh, that's trying to set a precedent for a particular business property. Um, the, it's just inappropriate to do that. So I appreciate the thought that's going into this. However, I also wanted to say, I think staff can use the plain English meaning of uh, what the code says and that the application that came in and tried to, you know, multiply a whole bunch of a series of events and only pull one permit, uh, they should have been laughed out of the city hall. Um, that's that's obviously not what the code says. And and why this had to come before you to add something to the code might not really be necessary. It's just that that was not the proper English interpretation of the words. I'd like the city attorney to comment on that since he's here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I believe next, that. Yes, John. our next speaker is John Mazza. John, are you available? John, you, uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, I just want to point out that this is a lot more complicated as far as commercial goes because the Planning Commission is, is taking certain buildings, for example, the uh, Norms Hotel, and strictly limited to UPs because of lack of parking and lack of parking in the area. And then we've taken other commercial buildings, such as the synagogue. It has 95 TUPs authorized, 95. So there are different requirements on different buildings for different reasons. And this can't be just blanket. Um, if you did this in, in the case of the uh, um, synagogue, you could have a, a an event every night. Right now we authorize an event every three and a half nights. So that's part of what the Planning Commission does and you do if it gets appealed uh, to take areas which are a problem and make sure they don't become a bigger problem. So I, I hope you instruct the Zoraces or whatever that this cannot change particular restrictions that have already been put in the CUP. Because then you'd have to amend a whole bunch of CUPs. Um, and we just don't have the time to do that. Uh, the, the synagogue hearing was four hours. Um, Norms was, you know, two meetings and a bunch of hours. So uh, this isn't something that Zoris can do in 10 minutes unless you narrow the narrow the um, discussion put it that way thank you thank you and mayor we do have a raised hand from joe drummond so we'll hear from her next joe are you available hi yeah i just wanted to say i know on that um, the malibu lumber yard does summer sundays in the summer every um, Sunday, but I think they couldn't get a TUP because they were only allowed six per year, and it was uh, that was their whole allotment for the year. So I hope that this would improve. Otherwise, I guess they'd have to get a conditional use permit, which takes about three months for approvals. But um, hopefully, this will improve that. I don't know, but just putting that out there. Thanks, because my daughter sings there every summer, so it would be nice. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. 
And Mayor, we still don't have Bill Sampson back in the meeting, and I don't see any other raised hands from the public, so that concludes public comment. Thank you. Karen, you're up. Oh, thank you, Paul. Um, I, I, I think, I would like to think that by putting this to Zoraces, which I'm sure that Mikey and Steve already have some uh, opinions on this, um, and, and hopefully there can be some meeting of the minds there. And then putting it to the planning commission uh, before it comes back to council, it, I think we can come up with something sensible. Um, at the most recent um, business roundtable, Karen York, uh, who's been on the board of the Malibu Film Society, said that they were looking for a new venue. Um, and that they had even had some events outside of Malibu because they couldn't find anything here. So wheels are already in motion. It, it looks like the Malibu Film Society already acknowledges that they cannot continue the way that they have been. Um, Norm's Hotel, I don't know how that's going to work out. I, I don't even want to get into that right now. Um, and and the, for example, the Friday night Trancus events in the summer. Those have been really nice community events um, with some local bands playing and some outside bands. I've gone to them for years. Um, I know some of the council members go to them. Uh, I see that it's pretty much a local uh, event. Everything was fine until I think there was one this past summer. It was really, really crowded because it was a very popular, the most popular local band playing and it was the first time they'd played since the pandemic started so that one i'd never seen it that crowded before but i i would like to think that we're going to get to a place where where we can have local events continue without being a burden on you know on on the residents without impacting traffic too horribly Obviously, they're going to be more when the weather's good than in the winter. And it's supposed to be a huge storm starting tonight. I don't think we're going to have an outdoor local event tomorrow night. So that's all I have to say. I just think there's got to be something sensible to be found here. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? Thanks, Paul. Okay, so first of all, I, I think the ordinance is already clear you get up to six events in a year for a property, commercial property. Um, and you can't have an event that lasts more than 14 days, although I don't know of any events that last 14 days, but you, you get six, you get six events a year. Should that be a higher number? Maybe. I mean, the Trancus events are a good example. The Lumberyard music series is a good example. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure why it needs to be limited to six, maybe eight, maybe 10, but it, it, a number is going to be whatever the number is. And I don't even hear a suggestion that the number should be different, but maybe that should be thought about. But the number is what it is. Um, notwithstanding that clarity many years ago, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is anything that staff currently is doing wrong. Many years ago, apparently the staff determined to make a precedent that as long as you are using your property for whatever you're using it for within a 14 day period, that's an event. So, I mean, hypothetically, let's talk about the Seaview Hotel, for example, that, that one of these days may come into, come online and which we said we're going to limit to the existing six TUP per year. We, I don't think any one of us thought that meant that over the period of 14 days, you could have 14 to 28 events at the hotel. 14 to 28 weddings, bar mitzvahs, social light parties, whatever, and that you could do that six times a year, which gives you up to 168 events. But that's how the statute, the ordinance, is currently being interpreted. The reason I, fo I, I focused on this recently, I, I think the because I raised this is why this is now being proposed, and I'm glad it's being proposed, the Raffi Lounge, which happens to be the Seaview Hotel property, recently, for the first time, as far as I can tell, made four consecutive applications over four two-week periods for a total of over 20 events. 
their their application even the first time said series of seven separate events or a series of seven events, all for different groups of people. And they got one TUP for that and that worked for them. So they went and then they got another TUP for another seven or eight events over the next two weeks. And they're still doing it as of this moment. Now, should they be permitted to do that? I guess that's a policy question for the for Zeresis, for Planning Commission and for us ultimately, but that's not what the statute currently says. But there's this misruling from years ago that lets them get away with that. Um, the synagogue, they've got an appeal pending. So, I, you know, I'm not sure that that's a precedent to the contrary. Um, so that's that's the main issue here is, you know, what is an event? I mean, I think I think an event's pretty clear. An event is an event. If you're going to have a wedding, for example, that's an event. If you're going to have three weddings. Those are three events. If you want to have seven weddings, no, you don't get that under the current six TUP limit. But apparently you do the way it's being interpreted. Uh, public noticing. To me, that's a no brainer. We have a website. Our website could be better, but we have a website. Every, every application could just go on the website when it's made and the residents, everyone has immediate notification. They have the same notification the city has. And if they have an objection, they can raise it. I, in fact, I don't see why all permits of all sorts aren't just accessible on a port. I mean, we have a portal, but the portal's kind of behind. But, you know, Put all the permits on the website and then everyone can look at them and they can make an objection if they want. It's not limited to the people within 500 feet. Everyone will see it. And then lastly, the different requirements for small scale public events on city property. I, I, I've talked about that before. I think that makes perfect sense. I think that, you know, we I think the city should be allowed to have as many events on, for example, um, in, in Legacy Park, if they're appropriate for Legacy Park, that the city wants to allow to have that it shouldn't be limited to six. Um, the city is going to be making decisions as to whether they're appropriate to have them or not. So th this ought to be a rule for private property. So th those are my comments. I, I, I would like to see this get clarity. I think it's already clear, but since it's been misinterpreted, in my view, I'd like to see us get formal clarity. And um, the public noticing issue is a great idea. And the um, different requirement, in my view, for small scale public events is a great idea. So I would support sending this to Zeracis and getting it done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Mikey. Thank you. Well, it sounds like several of us wanted to see this come forward. Um, Trevor and I have been talking about this for a long time. And um, just to give clarity on what my thoughts are, it's been bothering me for quite a while on certain events that they need to go through this process. The one that really got to me was the landscape artists club barbara frond if i'm pronouncing your last name right there's 10 artists in this they're all malibu residents they're you know nothing about their age but they're not young and they wanted to show their paintings in legacy park it turned into a giant fiasco there was no impact there was no you know there was no uh, amplified sound it was during farmer's market. There was plenty of parking. The parking lot was open that we'd all approved. And, and when we finally got that event through, and oh, and it had been canceled multiple times because of COVID. So they had to go back through the process. It was just, it was just turned into a joke. Um, and it was probably approved. People were over there and it was great. It was awesome. I was there. I don't know who else went by. And people are going, wow, why, are you going to do this every weekend? And they're like, oh, yeah, there's no way. So I think no impact events should not be necessarily the same permit as you have for the chili cook-off. You know, this was a tiny event. There was just a few people wandering through. Um, I also agree that certain series, like the main reason I think series need to, we need to look at are mostly related to cultural arts, you know, whether it's art events, whether, you know, just non-impact events related to cultural arts in the city. We need to embrace that more. Yes, you guys brought up all sorts of examples that weren't even in the conversation I had with Trevor, uh, with people abusing it. And I couldn't agree more with that. That's not the intent of why I was pushing this forward. It was really to take care. Uh, I was really thinking more of the arts more than anything, in the, anything at all and how to promote it and allow there be access to being able to have these events where there's, in my opinion, no impact. And of course, the series too. I mean, 
if you're going to do a music event, often a series is the only way it makes sense. If it's like the Trancus event is a perfect example. Yes, there needs to be stipulations, but the ability to do one that's done right. They're great. They're great community events and filled with locals. So that's it. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Trevor, for all your help over all the months we've been discussing it. Okay. I'm going to jump in and do my comment. And I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate to live in walking distance of Vintage Market. And the developer, the designers of that place were very smart to put that lawn in next to the market and in front of where Christie's is. And it's, uh, I got to tell you, when it's summer and the summer series is going on, you run into people you haven't seen in three years there. It's a tremendous thing, and we ought to be trying to promote more things that have the community interacting with each other. Because it's at night, you get very few uh, people who aren't local. The other thing that happens there is it's, you know, people bring kids. It's wonderful. And, and I can't understand why you would want to, why anybody would want to limit that to six nights. It, it needs to be something that if people are willing to do things for the people of the community and where they can get out and talk to each other, I think we ought to do everything we can to promote it. Uh, and it's never been a big, you know, we're going to have this and hope that you take home a bag of groceries thing. They built a wonderful place with the public spaces in it. It's like telling the people who have the uh, Malibu Country Mart shopping center with the playground and tell them they don't want play dates there because it's a, you know, it's, if you have a regular play date there, is that a, a an event? Does it need a TUP? Uh, you know, it's, if we have people build spaces that are designed for public interaction, why do we want to limit their public interaction as long as they're not doing something that's noisy and going to make the neighbors angry? And it, to as far as noise goes, there is amplified mu music at Trancus, but I'm not aware of a single complaint from anyone in the in the neighborhood. So it's the city should be for the for the citizens. And, and we should not make it so hard for people to do something nice that the people want to get to. So, yeah, I think it should go to Zeracis and they ought to do something that makes good things continue to happen and make it easy for people when they want to do something to, to be legal and have a permit and not just have to just throw it out there and see if anybody complains. So... Now you want to make a motion? I'd love to make a motion that we uh, adopt the recommended action. And I'm, I'm guessing Trevor will read it for me. I will second it. It's a resolution, so I actually don't need to read it. I can if you want, but um, if you just want staff's recommendation, this is just a resolution to send it to Ceresi. We're not actually adopting an ordinance at this point. Right. And I look forward to Zoracis doing something that will be helpful to the communities in Malibu so that they get a chance to interact with each other. So we've got a motion and a second. Oh, Bruce, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I just want to say, I mean, I'm going to vote for that. I just, I hope that when it gets to Zoracis, I mean, Mikey and Steve, um, that you give thought to the potential abuse as well as the way to expand it for public use. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping we can get a, some public input when it comes to front of the races as, as much as we can, so that we can cover all these different bases. So yeah, there, there could definitely be a lot of outliers. Yeah, uh, we want you know yeah. the more the more we learn, the better off we're going to be. Great. All right, we got a motion and a second. Uh, Kelsey, will you be kind enough to take the roll? Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries.
And I'm going to I'm going to step way outside of my authority here and say that it looks to me like we finished the agenda and I'd like to adjourn the meeting. And I just want to say to Richard that I've known you 10 years and I never knew your name was Malika. And I appreciate your help in, in getting that one down here in the next year. I too will endeavor to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> yes. Sure. Never once corrected me in 10 years. See you all next year. Have a good holiday, guys. Holiday. Thank you. Thanks. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye. Here.